Very good afternoon from Helsinki and uh, good morning to North America and good afternoon to Europe. Welcome uh, to this online conference uh, on transparency in the digital environment organized by the Center for Ethics, University of Toronto. So thank you all for joining uh, the contributors as well as those following the stream on YouTube. My name is Ida Koivisto and I will be moderating this event. I'm very proud and happy to join a conversation with a distinguished group of panelists, which is both international and interdisciplinary. Uh, we will ha be having two panels today. First is the digital transparency between truth and power. And then the second, uh, the promise and perils of digital transparency. So these panels display the articles published in the recent special issue in the critical analysis of law journal. Uh, so we do this a bit like in a book launch style. So Marcus Duber and Simon Stern uh, kindly asked me to guest edit that issue. Uh, and so here we are. So uh, thematically, uh, transparency has become an astonishingly popular ideal over the last couple of decades. Its traditional habitats, the public law and political theory have lost their monopoly to define it. It has globalized and spilled over to new and disciplinary discourses, quite prominently in algorithms and automation, thus becoming almost a self-justificatory virtue. So transparency promises that we can witness immediately what happens in the chambers of power and by virtue of this witnessing, fix what needs to be fixed. But can transparency deliver its promise in a digitalized environment? Does power hide not only from transparency, but also in transparency? It is, just, is it just a figurative placeholder for information release practices, or has it become a meta discourse to assess the successfulness of those practices? To what extent is it legal, social, cultural, technical, or material? Uh, we, will be, we will be addressing uh, these questions from various angles today. So before we start the actual program, uh, just a few words on how we will proceed. All the presentations in the panel will be given in a row, so there will be uh, time for Q&A in the end of each panel. Uh, both panels will be held consecutively, so there will be no uh, breaks. And also, uh, the audience uh, are also invited to ask questions in the YouTube chat whenever, uh, but they will be addressed in the end of the panel. So, uh, without further ado, I will welcome you all, and I will move to the first, first paper, uh, which, in fact, I will be presenting myself. Um, just a second. So uh, one of our presenters, Monica Zalnieriute, could not attend, unfortunately. Uh, so I will be presenting her paper very briefly. So Monica Zalnieriute, who is from uh, the University of South Wales, Australia, uh, in her article, Transparency Washing in the Digital Age, Corporate Agenda of Procedural Fetishism, traces the prominence of the concept of transparency in contemporary regulatory debates to the corporate agenda of technology companies. In her piece, Monica first notes how the language of ethics has recently become very popular within technology circles. She points to a scholarly critique known as ethics washing and argues uh, that ethics discourse should not be mistaken as a push for stricter standards or regulation. We already have an established uh, discourse and language of human rights and regulation with legal obligations attached to them. Monica then introduces a concept of transparency washing. And this concept is similar to ethics washing. Yet Monica will suggest later in the article, it is a wider phenomenon. Transparency washing becomes apparent if we look quickly at the IBM, 
Google and Facebook websites. For example, using transparency rhetoric, IBM announced its IBM Policy Lab dedicated to policy development on, the, on transparency in AI in January 2020. Since 2019, Google has been developing its privacy sandbox, supposedly to improve transparency in targeted online advertising. And Facebook seeking to appear as transparent to its 2.6 billion active users, uh, launched a political advertising database and its infamous oversight board. Transparency rhetoric is both related to ethics, but it's also an alternative additional discourse because of its connotations to legal normativity. For example, transparency is one of the foundational values of administrative law, as well as another fuzzy legal concept known as the rule of law. The use of the language of transparency, in addition to ethics, thus deceptively imply the existence of legal obligations and regulations when there in fact are none. This idea of trust uh, and even fairness following automatically from transparency, Monica argues. Led governments and corporations alike to embrace transparency not only as an organizational principle, but a political ideal and value in itself. Uh, such fetishization of transparency is part of a wider phenomenon of procedural fetishism, which is prevalent both in public and private organizations. This is also mirrored in the tech industry, uh, where the idea of something, uh, where the idea that something that is seen can be trusted is prevalent. However, as the latest transparency initiatives of IBM, Facebook and Google suggest, this idea is wrong for it enables legitimation of policy on a macro level through transparency washing and sort of micro critique. Monica argues that this idea is wrong for at least three reasons. First, the idea is especially wrong in the tech sector because corporations often apply transparency ideal selectively by disclosing only what is commercially desirable for them to disclose and concealing anything that is not, regardless of how transparent they promise uh, the public and regulators they will be. Second, corporate transparency initiatives are often mere box ticking exercises to exploit transparency for marketing and branding purposes. Third, uh, ticking this transparency box also allows tech companies to proactively prevent any regulation of their activities. So countering corporate transparency washing, Monica argues, requires First of all, returning to focus back of the substantive problems in the digital environment. In other words, it requires pay paying attention to the substance of tech companies' policies and practices, not only procedure. Public actors instead need to create binding, legally enforceable mechanisms to hold the tech companies to account. Extending the binding obligations under international human rights law and administrative law principles to the private, uh, private actors is one option enforcing anti-trust and competition rules is the other. And this, this was it uh, very briefly, Monica's, Monica's paper. So now I take my Monica hat off and put my moderator hat on. <laughs> and I, I welcome to our next speaker who is a good colleague and friend of mine, Rika Kolu uh, from University of Helsinki, from a uh, shared chair between law faculty and faculty of social sciences. Please, Rika, the screen is yours. Thank you, Ida. And I'll just share my slides, which you should see now, I hope. Yes, we can see that. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so I'll jump right into it. 15 minutes is not a lot and I seem to be suffering from virtual jet lag between Helsinki and, and Toronto a bit. But what I wanted to run you through today is, is basically this. So I mean, I've always been intrigued in the question of 
what are the problems we are associating with technology, now with algorithms, with, with big data. So what are we talking about uh, as, as legal scholars, uh, which is my perspective, uh, and what are we trying to solve? So what are the problems and what are the solutions? And do the solutions really work to address the problems? Uh, how I'm approaching this high level question in my paper here now uh, is to through a combination of socio-legal perspective, where I draw particularly from legal theory and procedural law, which is my background. So I'm going a bit against what Monica would argue is procedural fetishism, uh, whereas I, do, I see that there's a lot of advantage in this proceduralization perspective. But I'm combining this socio-legal uh, research with two main branches outside of law. So science and technology studies, which is a broad interdisciplinary field, which has problematized what is meant by technology and how that is also about social processes and with human computer interaction, which is uh, which originally was an offshoot of, of human factors research and is particularly interested in design practices. And what I'm taking from human computer interaction, so HCI, is particularly perspectives on value sensitive design. What am I trying to accomplish? In this paper, I'm trying to understand the relationship between transparency and technological design and asking what does by design mean and does it work? Uh, transparency by design is one of those really focal principles uh, that is omnipresent, particularly in the European data protection framework, uh, the general data protection regulation, and means that all the data protection rights, transparency among them should be taken into consideration uh, by default and by design as a part of designing all data processing activities. So I'm trying to figure out what does that mean? Taking something, some legal principles and rights into consideration by design. Uh, in a nutshell, I end up with saying that transparency by design is not a solution, but if we tweak the wording a bit and talk about transparency of design, uh, that could give us a bit different perspective to look at these problems and solutions and perhaps uh, give us new tools to go forward. Uh, so what are the problems? Uh, one of my starting points is that, uh, that particularly in law and technology discourses, we very often have this idea that it is humans versus machines, that it's either or. And there are ideological roots dating back to the 50s human factors research to sort of support this idea that we need to figure out where humans are good at, where machines are good at, and sort of divide labor between these two based on, on those characteristics. I'm basically arguing that this is a very old fashioned way. And for me, it's always been interesting to try to approach this from the perspective of of asking where are the humans in machines instead of uh, upholding this dichotomy between uh, humans and machines. I think this is something that is really lacking, particularly in the legal discourse, which is very focused on full automation and replacing the humans. Uh, just to give you a illustration of that, um, in my background uh, in procedural law, uh, the debate of humans versus machines uh, looks pretty much like this. So we take the courtroom and when we talk about automation, digitalization, algorithmic decision making, we assume that this means uh, replacing the human judge uh, with a computer. And that's the problem we need to face and fight against. Uh, but I think this is already a very problematic starting point. And this comic, which is actually from a research group's uh, comic project, sort of also drives home the point that the computers, they are not the other uh, compared to humans, but instead they are the product of the social human driven practices that shape them. So that is sort of what I'm saying that the design is. 
Uh, coming from the STS side, uh, there's a lot of discussion of what are the problems. And uh, Mireille Hildeplant, for example, says that the problem with algorithmization and big data and automation is that it reduces human beings into something that is only calculated and, incom and computated, and that is something we should prevent. Whereas a classic of STS in law, uh, Sheila Chasanov has argued that uh, when we are talking about the relationship of law regulating technology, uh, humans always assume that there is, there is the possibility of control over technological systems. And that is also the ideology behind transparency, I argue, that transparency sort of promises us this control over technology, but we can always contest the idea whether such control is possible. Whereas as Julie Cohen argues that the relationship between law and technology is much more complicated, that it's not simply law trying to catch up with technological progress and trying to limit it, but uh, instead law is shaping what can be designed. And at the same time, law is shaped by this reciprocal, uh, reciprocal relationship with technological uh, design. So this is sort of what I'm building, building on. Then about the algorithmic transparency by default and by de design. Uh, I already said that the promise is control and legitimacy. And, as, and if we do this, uh, this control is uh, obtainable if we just exert it early on were already when designing those activities and designing technological uh, architectures. So basically data processing in this context. Uh, but what, is, what does this mean? What is the design here? Uh, I think that the transparency by design approach sort of assumes that by design is a regulatory tool. So if we do this proactive early on ex ante, thing, we can exert control. So by design is a solution. I'm sort of tweaking that around and saying that instead of, of design being, being um, a regulatory tool, it might be the object of regulation. If we look, at, look closer at design as a so, social human driven practice. And there's something interesting uh, comes to the front. So this observation of the architectural similarities between law and technology. Uh, there's, in a sense, there's nothing new in this idea because already Lawrence Lessig or Nicholas Luhmann or boundless amount of other scholars have pointed out that technological and legal normativity have similarities. But now I'm sort of approaching this and uh, making the same connection from the perspective of design. Because if we look at what design originally, uh, uh, what we uh, originally associated design to is architecture. We design and build buildings. And then uh, quoting the famous, famous uh, citation, uh, we first design our buildings and then our buildings design us. And I'm sort of with this design perspective uh, and pointing out these similarities, these architectural similarities between law and technology, it is possible to make this shift between design as a regulatory tool and design as an object of regulation. So uh, I'm arguing that design is, is what gives rise to the consequences of algorithmization that we talk quite a lot uh, in relation to all things digital. Uh, those, those discussions are well known. They are discrimination, uh, they are privacy discussions. A lot of those, uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion in the EU now with the new AI regulation proposal about uh, combating these negative uh, consequences that might be infringements of uh, human and fundamental values. And I'm saying that we can trace back those mechanisms that give rise to consequences to design processes. And when we start to look at those design processes, well, suddenly we start to understand the dynamics of what happens there. 
and design uh, is something that is always context specific. It is always shaped by the humans who participate in it, how it is organized, what are the methods, uh, the development methods, what are the goals. And this is something that I see very much lacking in the discourse on technology regulation. So, so we tend to talk about the consequences and problems and the solutions on a very abstract level. But this way, when we focus on the design practices, we are able to suddenly see the value decisions that are negotiated and compromised on or completely left out in the design processes. When we look at design uh, from this perspective, we also see how difficult it is to sort of come up with universal rules to rein in that, because ultimately uh, different every uh, design process is individual in itself, so very context sensitive, and hence law has difficulties in grasping that. But basically, uh, this all boils down to the idea that if we look at those decisions, we sort of repolitize technological uh, design because that also addresses, or that's another shortcoming uh, in the existing discourses. This, uh, this notion that technology uh, would be somehow neutral or objective because it's based on maths or that uh, it is beyond our grasp. But once we see that those politics have just moved on a different level uh, of individual design processes, we suddenly see those as, as a question of politics. And we can see that the legitimacy gap, uh, which is another big term thrown around quite a lot, actually uh, is there. And hence, if we start to think about making those design processes. Who, so who participates there? Uh, what is negotiated? Uh, is the objective for design to go for uh, cost savings or to improve quality of decision making? Once we make that visible, uh, we suddenly open up a new, whole new regulatory arena behind data protection law or AI regulation, namely public procurement or, or standardization and all of that. And it's, that's something we can regulate. We can regulate humans. And thus I'm basically, uh, and I'm concluding here, I'm arguing that transparency is an architectural metaphor to begin with. And this is something that Ida already highlighted in the special issue, uh, that there, the promise of control lies in the idea that there's, there's a glass window or a glass house we can look through and when we can see, we can control it. But I'm, I'm uh, advocating that we change the architectural metaphor to another one also uh, drawing from this idea of architecture. And this comes now from the procedural perspective. So instead of trying to look in and exerting control and exerting uh, quality uh, by transparency, I'm saying that we should talk about access. So getting, getting in. And that is also something that in the, uh, in the human computer interaction lingo that addresses the design practices and the design methodology uh, could be translated quite easily to usability. And that could be the new way forward to regulating the algorithmization of decision making. Uh, thank you for listening and Ida, back to you. Thank you so much, Rika, and and thanks for for keeping keeping the time so so nicely. Uh, so you still had forty four seconds, uh, and you you already stopped. So that's that's sad. Uh, but maybe we can we model can student. Indeed, indeed. Uh, so I have to put my third hat on. So not only moderator hat or Monica hat. Now I'm putting my presenter hat <laughs> on. So I will present uh, next to my own paper. I hope I can moderate myself and keep the time well. Uh, so uh, please, somebody, you can. If I'm I'm, I'm exceeding the time, just chat me <laughs> on the on the uh, Zoom chat. But I, I think I should be able to keep the time. 
Okay, uh, let me share some slides. So, uh, uh, can you see? Uh, can you see it now? Okay, perfect. I was quite happy with this this first slide. It's like a movie, and I think it's perfectly <laughs> perfectly uh, illustrates what what I'm going to talk about. So uh, my, my presentation is, is called Digital Rare Window, Epistemologies of the Digital Transparency. And I will be addressing two uh, intertwined themes. The first will be uh, uh, digital reality production. So how does the world portray to us uh, in the digital setting and what transparency has to do with that? The second theme is we as perceive, perceivers of that, that world, that, that uh, digital reality, what kind of subjects does that make us and what follows from that? So uh, sometimes our time is described as the one that creates access to truth. Uh, we, are so, uh, we are surrounded by so much information that we could have ever have dreamt of just some, some uh, decades ago. But I want to ask, has this abundance of easily accessible information left us with a clear view of reality? And can we trust what we see online? And even deeper question is, are we confusing data and, uh, with reality and media with the world? So these questions are actually very philosophical, though they are <laughs> phenomenological and epistemological questions, but they are quite burning and and, and acute at the, our, our time of, of digitalization. So how is reality portrayed uh, uh, us online? And how does transparency, what, what does transparency has to do with it? These are the, the, the questions I'm, I'm revolving around in this presentation. And I was very, um, uh, I like this uh, quote from Guy Debord was many, many decades ago. Uh, when he said that all that once was directly lived has become mere representation. And I think we can kind of, uh, uh, we, we can relate with that in the time of, uh, time of the pandemic when we, we are in online conferences and, and experiencing the world to digital media. And of course, we can still ask, is it a representation or is it actually a simulacrum, as Baudrillard has said? Have we entered hyper-reality? Uh, I want to show this picture. Uh, there's a, on, uh, there is a web page called the, uh, the Window Swap. So uh, these day, pandemic, pandemic days when people are very bored looking at their outside their own windows, they're, they're, you can open a window somewhere in the world and then it, it gives you new sceneries. And this was a random picture. Uh, uh, of, of somebody's uh, view from, from their window. Uh, first, I'm interested in how about this transparency, I call it here in this presentation, a meme. So how has it become so popular as it has? And Emmanuel Aloha has called it uh, as a magic concept of modernity. It becomes so popular and so unquestionably good that it's very difficult to be against it. It has a positive halo or aura, and it has a normative pull to it. And as Rika well described, uh, and I, I also, also mentioned in the beginning, the premise and the promise of transparency, in particular in governmental section, um, governmental uh, power is that power is legitimate uh, so long as we, the citizens in democracy, can see how it is used and keep it in check. And this is often uh, thought to create trust. However, I want to question this and ask, is transparency a guarantee or antonym of trust? As the philosopher Han has said, uh, uh, that, that trust is possible only between knowing and not knowing. And transparency, in contrast, it, it uh, specifically uh, promises knowing and uh, getting access to immediately to, to reality without any any uh, uh, mediation or or uh, any any other people. So uh, maybe by, by virtue of this and this all uh, positive connotations, transparency vocabulary has found its way into the digital uh, environment. Uh, phenomena such as social media algorithms, uh, 
uh, automated decision making and uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Okay, my next slide. Okay. So the next theme I want to go is transparency as a medium. Claire Birchall has called transparency a cultural signifier of neutrality. However, instead of, of neutral medium, transparency is here approached as ambivalent concept, uh, which is closely connected to the way in which we experience reality and truth. And this, as I said, I, I said uh, this is very phenomenological questions. I'm interested in how does transparency mediate between the representation and the real thing. So what is, what is behind those flickering lights in the Plato's cave and digital environment? And how to detect a medium? Sometimes it can be, uh, it can be difficult. If you think about mirror, for example, we would not necessarily think that as a medium. We just think that, hmm, you know, we can see our, our picture in the mirror. We don't think that it's particularly flattering picture or particularly horrible picture. It's just us. But if we think that more closely, you can see that a, mi a mirror is a medium and it has particular characteristics. For example, it is inverted around its vertical axis. So uh, how is transparency as a medium? And how are algorithms as mediators of the digital uh, transparency? How can we see their operations of their mediation? So we, I'm asking how we can see how transparency mediates uh, uh, mediates uh, uh, the reality in digital environment. And then I'm going to uh, the questions of, uh, of transparency of abstractions. So how does transparency as a medium allow us to see its object when it comes to things such as governance and or power? So the question is, how can we make abstractions visible? And uh, I'm, I'm, I didn't mention it, but I'm, I'm writing a book about transparency, and uh, it's uh, one of these theoretical concepts I'm, I, I'm using is icono ambivalence, and this this word means that when we're approaching transparency as an ideal of governance, we uh, are encountering a paradox. On the one hand, transparency is an iconoclastic ideology, and by that I mean that transparency should be established by by removing all kinds of obstacles of visibility. For example, we have this metaphors of, of lifting a wheel or opening a curtain, or indeed in the digital context, opening a black box. So there's something which is hindering visibility and by removing that, transparency could be established. So the idea is that uh, transparency is suspicious towards all kinds of icons, facets and mediation. On the other hand, we're talking about abstractions they don't have any visual, any, any visual makeup to show or mimic. For example, governance doesn't look like anything. It is a social construct. And for those to, to become transparent, we need people and their mimetic faculties, their ability to, to represent things. And for that, we need all kinds of iconophilic practices. So these are positive uh, attitude towards all kinds of representations, pictures, uh, and texts. Uh, so in governance, we often talk about documents. We talk about algorithms, maps, pictures, statistics, all kinds of human made products. And this is what I call iconophilic aspect of transparency. So icono, uh, icono ambivalence would mean both this, this kind of oscillation between iconoclastic ideology and iconophilic practice. And what follows from that is that we can never be quite sure of the quality and the extent of human mediation between the real thing and its representation. And this, call, this, uh, this uh, leads to something that Mattis uh, van de Port has called the shakering over mediation. So to this, the next, next uh, theme, uh, uh, topic of the presentation, I want to ask who are we online? What kind of subject does this digitalized reality make us? And I think we are in also in, we have kind of a split identity online. On the one hand, we have a lot of agency, how to portray online, 
how, uh, what kind of masks we want to wear or we can wear. Uh, we, we can choose how we are in different chat rooms, uh, social media platforms. We have all kinds of avatars, pseudonyms, usernames. Uh, we, don't, we are not restricted to our materiality. On the, one, on the other hand, we all the time leak information to our online behavior uh, because we click and we like and, and, and so on. And all these commercial powers are, in, uh, are extremely interested on how we, uh, how, what are we actually behind the scene in the, in the back states, uh, as, as Irving Goffman would call it. So this is paradoxical. We are simultaneously pushed to be the most intimate selves to commercial powers. So this is what Zupov had called um, uh, surveillance capitalism and given more power to curate our online presence in our digital social life. And in consequence, we are, we are in this individualized realities, I call here bubbles, uh, to the techniques of surveillance capitalism and reality business. If we approach transparency as an avenue to truth in the digital environment, our democratic system encounters assumptions it does not readily recognize. So transparency uh, to work for greater good, there must be a shared understanding of reality. A life in bubbles uh, uh, for one is by definition insular. How can democracy work if the individual realities become too distant from each other? There are many threats, for example, reality distortion, the decline of journalism and flow of misinformation like in the COVID pan pandemic has shown, and the impact of surveillance capitalism. So the misuse of digital technology uh, may manipulate and weaponize facts that affect people's trust in institution and each other. So we need to ask why questions of access to reality are framed particularly as questions of transparency. In the digital environment, the demands of transparency have increasingly started to be a matter of reality curating algorithms, the infamous uh, black boxes. And although uh, law is in many ways toothless in regulating digital reality pro uh, production, some issues have already been recognized in legal uh, in legal uh, discourse. For example, and, and this is now very topical in the EU regulation uh, agenda at the moment, but so, so far not much uh, regulation uh, has been given, except for the GDPR we are going to hear about later today, and Rick also mentioned it. But for example, in this, in this uh, uh, recommendation, uh, the declaration by, by the uh, uh, Council of Europe, it is said in the paragraph nine, fine-grained subconscious and personalized levels of algorithmic persuasion may have significant effects on the cognitive autonomy of individuals and their right to form opinions and take independent decisions. So quite a lot is at play. It's our, not a, <laughs> it's our cognitive uh, autonomy, how we can know what to do in the, in the in digital environment, we cannot really uh, count on that we, we know what is happening. So to conclude, just a, just a few points. Uh, the promise of transparency, the access to objective reality, which further enables necessary democratic action, is jeopardized in the digital environment. So although transparency is traditionally seen as one of the best tools of democracy, with the emergence of individualized digital the realities and the decline of the shared understanding of truth, this truth transparency nexus might be unraveling. So thank you. That's that's it. I hope I uh, I kept that time. Okay. <laughs> so back my moderator hat. <laughs> uh, we have our third presentation of this panel, and this would be uh, Oana Brindusa Albu and uh, Hans Krause Hansen from Copenhagen Business School. And this will be uh, presented by, by Oana. So Oana, please, the screen is yours. Excellent, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ida. I'll just share. 
All right. I guess you can see. Yes, we can see. Wonderful. Thank you. I will uh, first thank you kindly for uh, for inviting us. Uh, I think I will try to keep it around 10 minutes or so to, to have a longer debate because we have so many exciting insights that you have uh, you have touched upon earlier. So I guess it will it will uh, lend to a nice discussion. And I think our uh, our article and what we are going to uh, talk about today sort of fits nicely and feeds nicely into uh, what Rika and Yuida have um, have talked about. Um, our, our article in our presentation is entitled uh, Three Sides of the Same Coin, uh, Data Fight Transparency, Biometric Surveillance, and uh, Algorithmic uh, Governmentalities. And um, I think I'll just part start by specifying or saying, um, because I haven't included that in the presentation, but I think it, I'm realizing now maybe it's worthwhile just specifying the sort of the you know, like where do we come from? We are the Department of uh, Management, Society and Communication, so it's quite broad. So I think what we bring to the table is, is not a legal perspective, but it's a sort of sociological um, science and technology and Foucauldian studies perspective. So I guess they fit broadly under under a sociological uh, approach. And I think they equally fit into what uh, Rika was talking about, the right, the sort of science and technology um, sort of uh, say tradition that kind of problematizes, right? Uh, such dichotomy between uh, humans and or uh, human agency and technological agency. And this is what we, we also put forward in the paper through the, the concept of, uh, of surveillance assemblages. So that we don't think, you know, that they're simply machines or algorithms there by themselves sort of working to create uh, surveillance and new conditions of you know, social life, or that there are simply people behind screens uh, you know, watching, but rather that we have this sort of concept that I guess it was theorized by Deleuze and the rest of, uh, of authors after, right? Of an assemblage that you cannot really separate, even if you want. I mean, I, I suppose theoretically we could think about that, but in practice, everything is so entangled, right? And I guess other sciences from physics to so on have, uh, right, have proved that we cannot really separate. Uh, materialities between them and so forth. And then I guess the, the say the, the epistemological lens in how we understand transparency and so forth and the ontological uh, approach to it is that I think we, I would say that we don't assume that there is a certain truth, so, that in, so to speak, or that we can even identify that but rather that such um, technological agencies or such algorithms or you know, social media algorithms or technologies and so forth, all of this contribute to creating a certain reality or truth. So it becomes so difficult to sort of, again, to distinguish between, as we can see in daily life, right, between what is real and truth and what is not. And we are sort of all um, right, embedded in, in these realities. So starting from this sort of standpoints in our um, article, we, we try to problematize uh, that the, the sort of discourse that, right, the transparency has become a marker, right, for accountability, participation, fairness, and justice. But at the same time, the ideal of transparency is complicit with uh, technological developments that they challenge these values. And specifically, if we think, I mean, I don't know how many of you here in the, in our room, virtual room, are using, uh, you know, the, have an iPhone or a Samsung or an Android and are using the facial recognition to open your phone, maybe some of you do. And it is exactly this sort of footprint that we leave when we use uh, smartphones that, right, that make human conduct visible. And of course, there are, you know, there, there are advantages to this. And I guess whether it, uh, you know, if we think nowadays in terms of public health or, uh, you know, or education or applications in justice, such form of uh, making visible human behavior helps in many ways, perhaps in creating, you know, I don't know, better, more democratic societies, so on. But at the same time, as uh, Ida was also mentioning, right, these sort of digital footprints, they are uh, harvested and they're turned by, by um, you know, media conglomerates and by the companies who, which own these platforms. They're turned in what has been called, right, by Zuboff, the, the, the raw material of um, capitalist surveillance. And essentially, this means that this sort of traces that we leave uh, right on, on these technologies are used to, you know, by various actors for creating more forms of control and, uh, and dominance. 
And in this respect, we argue, coming from this sort of standpoint, we argue that data file transparency is a form of transparency that results from, um, from facial recognition technologies. And in this respect, we um, argue that when you know, different actors, whether they're corporate or institutional, um, when they pursue this ideal of transparency by using uh, facial recognition technologies, there are different risks and different dynamics of power and control that are created. So the sort of unintended consequences, right, that uh, Rick Howes was talking about um, earlier. And um, from this standpoint, we are arguing that the sort of the, right, the, the second side of the coin of data file transparency in a digitalized context is biometric surveillance. So uh, differently put, um, biometric surveillance is inseparable from you know, datified transparency practices in, a, in our current you know, digitalized environment. And um, this is mainly because we argue that uh, such transparency ideals nowadays are driven by um, civic and market logics, where essentially uh, you know, state actors or corporate actors they are using um, such a deal of transparency to create human behavior visible. And I guess most of us have seen this in, um, um, you know, in, the, in the Chinese social credit system or perhaps in the, the UK's uh, trials of live uh, facial recognition. And uh, I mean, I'm not giving too many sort of details uh, now in the presentation. In the paper, we give quite a, a detailed and broad overview of uh, of these different uh, uh, applications of, of biometric technologies. And um, to, to add even a third layer on top of this, um, something that is associated with data file transparency and biometric surveillance, so the third side of the coin, uh, are uh, algorithmic governmentalities. And uh, we argue that these are um, are emerging are first of a form of social ordering in that the facial uh, identification and analysis they are these are computed by an algorithm and these algorithms are in a sense um, you know they're of course opaque but they they have an, an additional layer of complexity because most of them are machine learning based algorithms so artificial intelligence based neural network based algorithms that they are opaque even to the coders. So although we may try, you know, or there are certain attempts to regulate the coders, uh, conglomerates companies can say, well, we know to a certain extent only how the, the algorithm works because we don't, you know, we cannot analyze its design because it learns by doing. And uh, the, the sort of the risks or the dangers here uh, at play are what we talk about the certain biases, right? And I guess this is nothing uh, new or groundbreaking anymore. We have seen so many um, right news and uh, and side effects in um, in sectors such as uh, both public health or or law and so forth, where these algorithms that they have the agency right equal to a human agency to extract information from. Uh, um, from biometrics, and they make uh, right certain assumptions or decisions or calculations, so to speak, such as based on uh, issues such as race, gender, you know, sexual orientation, or the predisposition to commit a crime. And in the paper, uh, we give quite a, a large example of uh, of such cases. So whether it's uh, you know applications in the in the institutional sector in border security, so whether it's the U.S. or uh, Israel. Um, there have been many cases where people have been flagged as potential uh, you know, criminals by these technologies, mainly because the algorithm behind flagged that individual based on the, the calculations on the on facial recognition. Similarly, the many, uh, some of you have heard about the Amazon recognition software, which has been largely used um, uh, in the US. I think it was California too. I can't remember if it's, if it's Florida too. Maybe Mark can tell us if it was in the news there. But uh, I think it was used in five states in the US until um, uh, it was proven in many, um, in certain studies that, again, it flagged innocent individuals as potential uh, uh, criminals. And that led to arrest and so forth. And uh, a last example that we gave an overview was in the, um, in the corporate sector, where again, there's so many applications based on, on biometrics and facial recognition that lead to data breaches. 
So uh, the one um, famous example that is used more and more, both in Europe and in Asia, it's uh, called geofencing, where the individuals are given um, uh, targeted advertising based on their location and at a certain point in time, in, you know, in this case was a taxi or in a metro and so forth. And it has been identified in multiple uh, cases that this led to, um, to data breaches. So uh, in, in all, what we argue is that because of, of this problematic interplay between data file transparency, biometric surveillance, and algorithmic uh, governmentalities, we argue that there is a need for, um, for algo activism. It's what we call an, indi an individual or collective form of, uh, of resisting algorithmic control. And uh, I mean, there have been certain cases, research on this is, is still emerging, but we sort of withdraw three overall example where practical action oftentimes it's, uh, I mean, it's based on whistleblowing. And here we are somehow at the, right, at the mercy of the, or the self-sacrifice of the whistleblower that may work for, for conglomerate, uh, media conglomerate companies that can sort of, you know, disclose knowledge of what is going on, or uh, on practices of employee empowerment and knowledge sharing or legal mobilization. So whether it's freedom of information rights or surf legal regulation and so forth. And then the last, um, the last aspect of algo activism, which could be civic activism, where you know there are sort of individual uh, practices of resisting algorithm that social movements often uh, use. Whether it's uh, you know in Asia uh, there are cases of uh, using either hoodies with uh, sort of LED lasers that they block the facial recognition cameras, or using simply lasers in in the camera if you would know where the facial recognition camera is uh, is mounted or simply using counter algorithmic software on your computer that basically feeds junk into the, the system so you wouldn't be getting um, the, um, the, I'm wrapping it up in one minute, thank you. So uh, the, the, the algorithmic software sort of feeds junk so you wouldn't be getting the, um, the advertising that we tend to do, you know, when you open your the, the Gmail, you tend to get advertising of things that maybe you were talking two hours earlier and so forth. So that may help with it. So uh, yes, I mean, this is the, the brief overview of our, of our paper and I'm looking forward to, uh, to a discussion next with uh, the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Oana, and, and uh, also Hans, of course, <laughs> as uh, the other, other author of the paper. Uh, you're also, also great with, with time, I really appreciate it. So uh, now we have some time for Q&A and, uh, and welcome also Stefan, I, I see you are join us, <laughs> this is nice. Um, please, uh, wait, maybe you could uh, raise your hand uh, function and then I will just uh, give the address to you in, in, in order. Um, please, questions, comments, reactions. wants to start? Maybe Giovanni? Can I start no? maybe? Yes, yes, please, Giovanni. Oh, just so. So um, now thanks to everybody, uh, great presentations. Um, I have learned a lot. Um, I would like to put a question to, um, to Ida maybe. So Ida, I appreciated very much your uh, discussion of uh, transparencies and in particular how transparency needs uh, uh, algorithm mediation today because we don't have uh, uh, there is no avail, as you said, to, to, to take out in order to access the truth. Uh, but uh, uh, moving on the, from the critical to the um, uh, propositive or uh, future-oriented suggestions, uh, how do you see uh, that uh, um, uh, transparency can be uh, a meaningful goal uh, in uh, uh, today's context? Or do you exclude that this is the case? Thank you. Uh, maybe we could uh, uh, we could collect a few questions and and uh, and then and then we could uh, call to the answers if that's fine uh, by you. Uh, maybe I give the, the floor to to Hans. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, and and thanks for some uh, really good presentations. Um, so I have one one question for you, uh, Rika, and then one from for you, uh, Ida. 
uh, I think, um, you know, I think this idea of usability that you sort of landed the presentation on is, is interesting, but I wonder whether it's uh, how is whether you link it to some kind of underlying idea of empowerment or uh, because you also talk about access and 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 uh, as soon as you begin to 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 sort of move into that territory, the question of agency comes up. I think, and so I just wanted you, perhaps you could elaborate a bit on on, on the connection between the idea of usability and the role of agency. And then for Ida, I was just wondering. I mean, it, I, I really take much of your sort of insightful treatment of the idea of mediation. Uh, I think, and that's absolutely crucial to any discussion about transparency, whether in digital environments uh, or, or not. You know, so so I think I fully I fully take that. But but I wonder whether mediation is, in your account, a sort of premise or a basic condition for transparency or whether um, you consider transparency as as the sort of pivot in mediation and then if that's the uh, or the sort of machine of mediation and if that is the case then whether you have an assumption of of a reality behind uh, that we can actually access um, because you also on your slides you talked about you know reality and objectivity and stuff like that. So so I think there is a kind of epistemological and ontological, ontologically really important um, discussion in, in in your presentation and in your paper as well. Maybe you could just elaborate and clarify it a bit. Thanks. Thank you, Hans. Uh, maybe one more question and then we we have a uh, we can answer uh, if there is somebody who wants to react uh, now. Uh, Rika, please. Uh, actually, I had a question to Anna and Hans and something that we could hopefully discuss all together. So, so what is your stance on this, this hybridization point where we, we agree that it's not humans versus machines, but instead it is this socio-technical hybridization where all gets mixed up. Uh, where does this argumentation and this acknowledged uh, fact take you? Thank you, Rico. Maybe we uh, before uh, I, I get the next round, which is starting with Mark. Uh, I think that we still remember uh, this question. Maybe I will answer the two questions was addressed to me, and maybe then Rika and then Oana and Hans. So uh, to to Giovanni, but Giovanni just uh, is not <laughs> there. Uh, maybe I I, st I start with with Hans's question. If Hans is Hans is there, <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, the mediation is, I think it's just the very core of my uh, my theorizing of, of transparency. And I think that mediation is always there. We That is an escapable feature of transparency, starting from the very metaphor of, of it, that there is something between the, the, the beholder and the object, if you will. And I just think that once we go to... Uh, uh, we go digital, it get, it's gets even more complicated uh, what kind of mediating technology can there be. And of course, I, I, it's very difficult to say whether there is reality or not, but I think it's what is interesting that transparency as an ideal presupposes that there is a, a reality there. This is based on some kind of reality principle or realist conception of truth. And now in the, the, the age of, of digitalization and, and hyper-reality, if you will, we really need to reassess uh, this premise. And I, I don't think I have a, a ready answer whether there is reality out there, which is of course a shame. It would be very nice to, <laughs> nice to have that. Uh, I think that is one of the, the smoking guns of transparency's uh, uh, attractivity, if you will, because it has this promise. Finally, I can see by myself what is happening there. And uh, Giovanni, um, oh, well, I have horrible handwriting. Uh, I guess yes. Yeah, so what about <laughs> if, if transparency is, is viable? Uh, uh, I don't know if it's viable or uh, it's meaningful in, in the digital environment. But at least the, there is, I think, something there. It becomes so uh, so prevalent. This this these discourses. Uh, maybe ex except, exactly because of this, its promise. Um, but I, I think it's 
it's, it's cognitively uh, reassuring to us that there would be transparency, but, but I'm very transparency skeptic. Uh, and therefore, uh, I don't think there is much actual transparency in digital environment, but we need to, I think we, we seem to need to think that there can be. Maybe I, I stop here and I, I let Rika to answer to the questions was addressed to her. Hello. Unless uh, Giovanni or Hans wants to, to respond uh, quickly. No, no, just to thank you for your, for your responses. Great. Uh, thanks a lot for the clarifications. Okay. Uh, I, can't, I can't uh, avoid the temptation to answer a bit Giovanni's question to read as well, whether transparency is a meaningful goal. Uh, I think I think that's that's why it is so ambiguous and so ambivalent and interesting thing that there is something, but but it is there's no silver bullets. There's no silver bullets anywhere. Uh, so and I think the fact that transparency is so many things and it can be used for so many so many different goals and aspects and it's a super principle in a way like Ida says magic concept. That's why it is so intriguing. So maybe it is, maybe it isn't probably both at the same time. Uh, to Hans's question about usability as a solution, uh, I'm, I'm skeptical about all solutions and silver bullets, but uh, I'm interested in, in broadening the, the scope of, of existing tools. Uh, I think you, I agree with you that the underlying idea there is empowerment and agency and sort of, sort of, uh, I think that's that's really vital and that's also the connection point sort of between all these different theoretical influences I'm bringing together. So sort of the uh, procedural due process, access to justice ideology, which is very much about uh, the experience of being heard and the experience of, of fairness. Uh, then this STS uh, discussion about uh, in which way sort of uh, individuals move in this hybridized uh, socio-technical architectures uh, and, and where's agency and how, and then this uh, sort of more technical human computer interaction idea of, of how do we design better systems and what is a better system? How do we measure that? So. So here, I, I think I have that engineering strain in me who sort of wants to have measurable usability instead of just, or in addition to these mushy uh, principles. But yeah, I think that the connection uh, usability is where sort of this access to justice ideology and this uh, technological design and this user experience research meet. And that could be fruitful ground that I'm I'm hoping to discover uh, in the coming years, but uh, but yes, interesting things will sort of happen in this field in any case. Thank you, Rika. Then then uh, Oana and Hans, and then I will give the floor to Mark unless there are uh, quick responses to to these uh, these addresses. Please, Mark. Uh, uh, sorry, Hans and and Oana. Yeah. I guess I will just briefly try to uh, to address uh, Rika's comment. I mean, I I believe it, it depends how you sort of you understand um, sort of assemblages or this intertwinement or entanglement between humans and technology. I would say that it's anything but mushy. It is not mushy. It, it's more that we cannot really separate and. This means that we need a sort of a different concept of understanding rather than understanding just human agency and then technology agency. It, it's been clear that technology in itself, right? Self-learning algorithms have agency and they, they develop that, right? And they do things. And I think it's difficult, difficult to measure them because you can only, as a coder, you can only code as much as your code allows, right? You have a certain limit, but you cannot sort of code AI, AI codes itself. Right. So I think there we need, and I think there has been a lot of research coming from the sort of maybe perhaps it's France, Canada, so on, on what's called the, the distributed agency and their different methodologies, right, to sort of to try to scale actor networks and to see how they would work. 
I guess at the practical level, and I think this is what the EU is trying now, right? But I guess you know more than me in terms of regulations, but I have seen that the, the different panels placed at the commission and the sort of research coming out from Horizon 2020, it's is focused on developing forms of regulation that not only regulate humans, but also regulate this sort of form of technology, right? That in here I think is the paradox, right? How can you regulate a robot that learns by itself? Right? And how can we de design, or perhaps, I don't know, we need algorithms that do regulations because they, they can do that. I don't know what, I guess this is a short answer. Thank you, Anna. If there are no uh, reactions to, to this, I will, I will uh, give the floor to Mark. And uh, also please, in, the, in YouTube, uh, if you have anything to ask, you can also ask questions in the chat and I, and I, I can uh, bring these questions to, to, to this forum too. But now, Mark, please. Uh, thanks, Ida. Uh, this is going to be fairly incoherent because I had an idea and then a lot of the comments uh, to the last set of questions just sort of further push the ideas that I had uh, for a comment. So uh, the two things that rattle around in my head with respect to transparency or ideals of authenticity that you know, we can see the real, uh, as uh, Ida talked about, and representation, the idea that we are able to see in a public sense uh, what it is that is, uh, what it is that our representatives, uh, whether officials elected or civil, uh, are, are doing. Um, but uh, so many of the papers have sort of problematized that for obvious reasons. Uh, and, you know, in terms of the idea that we are, that, that the public is both an audience of, of that which is made transparent and also the subject the, and the object uh, of uh, surveillance, um, the distinction between the public and private spheres, which break down considerably, uh, in governance and also in all the issues that got raised. And the distinction that I feel like we're continually making between we and they, uh, that is we represent the public in our, and need to find out what officials are doing uh, and the they then are the officials, but there's also the they that is technology, the they that is uh, those uh, private entities that are developing technology and things like that. And that sort of leads me to the question of what sort of, we need to theorize not only the, uh, the question of transparency, but also the question of accountability. Who is it that we are, uh, who is it that we are looking to, as Rika said, not to provide a silver bullet, but to pr provide a set of processes, uh, uh, procedures, if you will, as Rika used the term, um, the institutions that can help us to, uh, to figure out the way in which we can both break down that which is opaque in the concept of transparency and also recuperate that which it, at least transparency tries to promise. So I'll leave it there. And that's, that is really to everyone and really to anyone. Great, <laughs> thank you, Mark. Uh, who wants to respond? <laughs> Hans, please. Yeah, okay, so thanks, Mark. I think these are, are great points. I think um, what a, one of the core contributions of, of some of the papers in this special issues is precisely that they question taking for granted distinctions that you sort of lined up. So the distinction between the public and private, um, we, they, um, and so forth. And I think that's, uh, that's the first step um, that we need analytically to deal with uh, and how to do in, in our research practices to be able to raise new questions around transparency and especially in, in digital environments. Um, but the question then, which is left on our table is what would, and perhaps we don't dwell so much on that, at least from what I've seen from the papers uh, that I managed to, uh, to go through. I, I mean, uh, maybe we don't, put so much on offer as regards how to actually invest in new forms of accountability or new forms of contestation and, and resistance. And, and I think, uh, so, so having followed the discussions around um, and contributed to discussions around transparency and surveillance, and, and also um, as we do in this study, Wana and myself, you know, dealing with the question of algorithmic uh, governance uh, in this particular form. I mean, we, we tend to end up 
uh, deconstructing the whole thing, uh, raising all the, I would say, uh, most of the central questions in terms of, of research the science and, and how to explore this from new angles. But we have not so much to say about what can actually be done to do exactly what you um, what you indicated, namely to to um, uh, to speculate on recuperation, to speculate on on building up new things, and and, and I would be curious to engage in a project on exactly that. In our paper, what we did was to dig it a bit into the current debates about algo activism, which you, from a perspective of, of accountability, you know, you, you see that could see that as an example, but this is emerging research. And even if you go take a look at, at, at Supov's book on surveillance capitalism, I mean, it's, it's that's not you know, 700 pages and, and not so much uh, said about uh, what's next, right? Uh, or, you know, it, dwelling on, on, on possible maze ways to move forward. So, so I think you're touching on, on something extremely important here, both for analytical purposes uh, in terms of vocabularies, but also strategically uh, as human beings, how do we deal and tackle this? Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Then uh, Giovanni and then Rick. I would like to bring into the discussion a bit uh, um, what is a lawyer's perspective on transparency because uh, um, I, as a lawyer, there is the need to you know, extract from the discussion of transparency some uh, clues on how to interpret uh, the requirement of transparency that we can find, for instance, in the GDPR and uh, um, also in the um, new proposed regulation on AI. Uh, so we need uh, to uh, do something with these uh, uh, concepts. Uh, and uh, um, after hearing uh, uh, today's <laughs> this first presentation, I am a bit confused because as a lawyer, I am supposed to adopt uh, uh, transparency as a goal to determine uh, when a system is uh, or is not a transparency and uh, um, so, to decide or to, to have an idea also what transparency is for. So uh, my question uh, to you would be how you see the connection between the need to opera, operationalize the concept of transparency in uh, a legal practice uh, and uh, um, no, the rich content uh, of debate, of a debate like the one that we are having today. No solution, but just a question. <laughs> Uh, Rick, do you want to respond to Mar Mark's question or Giovanni's or or <laughs> or something uh, else? I'll start with Mark's Mark's uh, or responding to Mark's idea um, and sort of uh, trying to elaborate a bit more about the potential of procedures here. Uh, I think there's a lot of lot of potential there. That's why proceduralization is such a ubiquitous phenomenon right now, uh, but it of course has its limitations. And I think something that we need to remember here is that procedures are always also really powerful uh, technologies of, of justification. So, so the other side is rubber stamping or checklisting, like, uh, like with the ethics washing discussion that, okay, let's just tick the box that we did human oversight transparency by design? Okay, now we are ethical and compliant with law and good to go. Uh, and I think bearing that in mind, mind is, is really important. Uh, but at the same time, I think that the good thing about procedures actually connects what Hans and Oana are also arguing about uh, uh, algo activism. So it sort of connects back to participation and uh, inclusion and to go with the big words with uh, democratic legitimacy in a sense that of course procedures can be used as as rubber stamping but at least a procedure makes things visible and it is possible to get a seat at the table through proceduralizing something uh, in my context of of looking at this from the uh, perspective of design uh, we see that very often with the uh, design of technological systems, there's a very limited understanding, for example, who is the user of a system. Uh, and if we sort of start to problematize that and start to say that, okay, we, we need to like 
listen to and give a seat at the design table for a much broader audience, much broader public, we suddenly see that there's not a single user, but a lot of different uh, different user groups, and we can use that as a tool for inclusion. Uh, and, and sort of also uh, that way sort of add, add diversity and start to look at this uh, different capabilities of, of different user groups and different individuals. Uh, as to Giovanni's question of how to operationalize transparency, uh, well, I think this is my best bet of answering that, saying that, okay, let's, let's start talking about about uh, the design processes and saying that, okay, who got a seat at that table is something we need to make transparent and perhaps that's at least something. Thank you, Rick. I think I, I just uh, uh, misuse my, my, my uh, status as the moderator and, and I will briefly want to reflect on what Mark said before I give the floor to Stefan. Uh, yeah, I think, and, and I, uh, as you know, I'm very, very uh, uh, influenced and, and impressed by your work in my own work, and and I, I, I think uh, this authenticity and, and uh, representation are are, are are themes which are not uh, uh, under theorized in transparency discourse. Although they're often mentioned, but they're not really delved into. And I'm I'm <laughs> I'm trying to to do that in in, in my own work. But I, I, you, uh, I think also one of the big issues with transparency uh, scholarship is that we should also discuss more about the transparency being relational and it's social, it's deeply social and it's very human. And although we're, it's very, as I said, it was cultural signifier of neutrality, but in fact, there is not much neutral about, uh, about transparency. Of course, you could say that there's not much neutral about neutrality, but this is not the, actually what I'm saying, but I'm saying that there is, a lot of value charge in transparency can be used in a positive way or in a pejorative way, but it's often used as a value, value judgment and these value judgments are deeply social. And I think this is also extend to this public private distinction and, and power relations that we, we often want, you said we, they, this the, the dichotomy. And I think this is, uh, the dichotomy is often uh, established between uh, un, un, in an uh, unequal power relation and we want transparency when there is somebody is using unequal power over us, and then we want transparency. But when we are when we are uh, equals, the transparency requirements are way less. We have we we understand we have a right to have secrets and and, and strategies and all that. But but when you talk about power, uh, we have less tolerance to to secrets. Uh, just a, just a brief brief reflection to to Mark's Mark's comment. Uh, do you want Mark to say something before I, I give the, the floor to, to Stefan? <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Then, then Stefan, please. Well, first of all, uh, hi, nice to meet you. Sorry for being late. Uh, but I, uh, um, I'm really, um, I, I was thinking also about the, the transparency question from a legal point of view, uh, and maybe um, as this uh, special sort of uh, journal call also points out is that transparency is, is sort of an elusive con concept. Like it can mean many things and it can be, and also be misused for many things. But I think uh, I am a sort of naively hopeful in a sense uh, in a regulatory use of transparency concepts in the sense that uh, I could at least think of many worse concepts that could get at, you know, become at the central stage. So I think at, uh, then it's up to people like us and others to sort of pinpoint the, the, the powerful, most relevant stuff in the concept of transparency. For example, then, uh, okay, should we have like a process transparency? Should we force that upon uh, the large scale platform? So that at least like the EU commission sort of initiatives as of late, uh, or should we deal with more on uh, the literacy aspects of humans' understandings of how a tool works? But at least, I mean, sure, I acknowledge that it can be misused and can be, uh, uh, it could be very non-transparent as well. But uh, I think at, at, at least it opens the doors slightly and for us to sort of pinpoint, you know, is it the procedures, the documents, the technology, explainability issues, tricky parts of that, or is it like uh, the literacy side to it? So we can force those sort of paths and pinpoint that. Uh, um, 
So I think it's uh, like a, it's, it's like a, you throw up in, in the air and then it's up for people like us to sort of pull it down and pinpoint. What do you mean? What do we mean? What do we want it to mean in a sense? wants to to respond i think in this panel we are being a bit more away from from law per se and the next panel i think we are going to be a little bit more so <laughs> uh, about uh, uh, how law regulates transparency uh, katya please well i'm uh, i'm very sorry for ho hopping in and out it's friday evening and with two small kids that's a challenge but uh, I'm, I'm actually also thinking of asking a little bit of a, of a legal question to, to you, Ida, in fact, because you, you, you talked about a, a topic that is also very dear to me, namely disinformation on the, on the internet and visibility and phenology, everything which philosophy is dear to me. Uh, but to, to kind of boil it down to, to a more pragmatic question, uh, about disinformation on the internet. I myself am always wondering. So when you talk about freedom of expression uh, on, on the web as it is now, there is this kind of metaphysical pre presupposition that freedom of expression classically is that everybody can say whatever you want to say and that it's kind of equally represented. Uh, and uh, in, the, in recent years, there is more and more awareness that there is content moderation that you maybe need that to even to be able to, to, to have a debate. If you have too many voices, nobody is heard. If the whole internet is kind of completely, uh, completely overgrown by disgusting stuff and by politically uh, undesirable stuff, then there's no debate whatsoever. So to kind of connect to your question, what, what, what should be visible? So you, you have the kind of philosophical point that, that there's not really new, neutrality, there's always mediation when things are visible. But to boil it down to a more practical question, how do you cut that balance between kind of taking a step back, this kind of let a thousand flowers grow, we will not interfere, and uh, an active stance to actually be able to, to, to say something in the first place? Well, this is uh, this is very very difficult question, and this is something I, I'm always afraid, which is sound like a normative question. So I was like, oh, hey, norm normative. <laughs> uh, to short answer is I I, I don't really know. Um, I'm I'm sure you are you are right in your analysis, and 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 there is more and more content moderation, and and we are and as we lawyers know, uh, no human rights or fundamental rights are without exceptions and limitations. They are always there. But I guess is uh, who who regulates or who uh, who mandates these limitations and regulations? If we are not talking about law per se, but we are talking about uh, uh, so maybe transparency washing in in in, in Monica's terms. Uh, so wh who who moderates and on what which grounds? I guess that's also one one of these uh, topics where this call for transparency is very eminent. That we we should know how we are being moderated uh, in this in these platforms. But uh, I don't have a normative answer to, the, to, to, to you. <laughs> I think just that you are, uh, you are correct and, and think this some kind of moderation is necessary. At the same time, uh, it's always uh, somebody's view of the, of the good world and, and we should be very uh, careful uh, in detecting, detecting these power relations behind this, this reality moderation. Thank you. I, I very much agree that that is the big first step to show that it's not neutral to begin with. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? We have still a few minutes time before we go to the second panel. Is there anybody in the in the in the chat? Uh, at least I don't I don't see any uh, questions or comments. This might be, of course, because of my my technological <laughs> uh, savviness or the lack, lack of tear off. <laughs> um, okay. oh, Katya, do you have a new, new hand or yes. an old hand? Yes. <laughs> a new hand. Okay, that's, that's, that's a new hand. 
Please. Now, that my, that now that my husband is taking care of the kids, <laughs> I suddenly get very eager with questions. So I, uh, I was, uh, I was uh, wondering, Rika, uh, can you expand on that? I think it was during your last slide or something that you said it should not be about transparency, it should be about access. Can you just uh, expand a little bit on what you mean with that? Uh, I think in the in the Q and A we uh, sort of uh, discovered part of this this argumentation. So basically, uh, I'm arguing that 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 transparency is an architectural metaphor, like a, like uh, which is sort of linked with design already on a conceptual level. And I'm saying that uh, a me more meaningful. I have a problem with the word meaningful as well, because that gets thrown about in these discussions too often, but meaningful in any case, a more meaningful metaphor would be access. So instead of just looking in, it's about going in. And, and I take that from, from access to justice literature, and that sort of feeds back to the idea that, that uh, we should talk about who has access to the design process so who who is heard there and uh, whose views are implemented into into technological architectures and and in that way uh, because in that way we again uh, repolitize design as an activity so so i'm arguing that we very often talk about this legitimacy gap on the on the level that uh, that okay, the platforms use power, and there's there's no legitimacy because well, you all know the discussion, and Katya, you probably bet more much better than I do, but I'm saying that there's sort of like this mundane, this small mundane legitimacy gaps that take take place in the design processes, and and sort of looking at representation and inclusion there is important. So access to that table is is sort of an alternative metaphor, an alternative discourse. I uh, hope this answers your question. Yes, kind of, but is then the, the access, is it limited to, to having access to, to, to kind of contribute in the discussion about how to design? Is it kind of uh, to, that there is a more broader stakeholder involvement or kind of, I don't know how you would call it, like a more politicization or a broader amount of people who can have their say about the design process. Is that what you mean with access? That's a very, very good follow-up question. I think that's one part of, of what I, and kind of the most concrete thing I, I mean about access to the actual design process. And I think why I find that to be uh, uh, attractive solution, uh, well, is because it sort of contributes to this idea that, that we, we could then have uh, proper usability standards and from perspective of different user groups. And that's something we can measure. And of course, all quantifiable indicators, they have limitations in, uh, in themselves. But right now, I do think that this is sort of a wild west, this algorithmic decision-making discussion. So, so having some form of usability indicators would would be helpful but i don't think access or the power of potential of access would be limited to that so what we already discussed about algo activism activism or stefan's point about uh, sort of uh, giving trans through transparency and freedom of information acts and making all this public that gives people like us tools to pinpoint the problems i think that's another access thing and a third access thing, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, uh, is sort of this discussion that is already uh, going on in the in the policy circles, and uh, which which is also uh, in the EU's accessibility directive. So the idea that we should take digital divide and sort of different capabilities uh, into consideration when we design systems that are used broadly, particularly in in public administration so i think there's a lot of different access issues that are that are completely under researched right now in this context 
Thank you, Rika, uh, and thank you, Katya, and thank you, everyone, for a lively discussion. Uh, it would be nice to, to continue, but I, we have to, to move to our second panel. Uh, and now uh, the next presentation will be called Algorithmic Transparency and Explainability for EU consu uh, Consumer Protection on Rubbing the Regulatory Premises, and this will be a paper by Mateusz uh, Grochowski, Agnieszka Jablonowska, uh, Francesca La Gioia, and Giovanni Sartor, uh, all from the Uni uh, European University Institute, uh, Florence, but also I think they all have some other affiliations as well. Uh, maybe you can introduce uh, those yourself if you, if you so wish. And this uh, paper will be presented by Mateusz. Uh, please, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let me let me share my screen. Okay, I hope you can everything. See it. Yes. Perfect. Excuse me. Excuse me. Say it again. Yes, please. We can see your slides. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. So um, yes, thank you. Thank you everyone for, for attending this session. And uh, in particular, many, many thanks to, to, to Ida for making this, this whole event possible and also for making the special issue of the critical analysis of law possible. Um, our paper uh, tries to somehow unpack the, the regulatory premises of the European Union law vis-a-vis algorithms in the consumer economy. And uh, what, have we, what we have been trying to do in, in, in our paper is, first of all, uh, an attempt to analytically uh, examine the existing framework for, for uh, algorithms on the, in the consumer economy that we have right now in the European Union law. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, better understand the underlying premises of this of this framework. So, what aims are followed by the European Union law, and uh, how the particular shape of the, of the policy and regulatory assumptions of the EU law has emerged. And secondly, we are also trying to pose some more subversive, I would say, questions on uh, to what extent uh, the existing model of regulation is effective and can indeed deliver its promise can indeed function well in order to achieve the goals that are envisaged by the uh, EU law. Um, and uh, as, as Ida said, we uh, in writing this paper, we are coming from different uh, perspectives and from, the, from, from, from different backgrounds, because um, uh, part of us has a stronger interest in new technology and, and uh, algorith algorithms as a, as a separate area of study. A part of us has a has stronger focus on, on consumer protection and some overlaps between consumer protection and, and, and new technology. So by building this, this, this group, we are trying to, to achieve some kind of uh, conceptual synergy over these issues. And um, as, as Ida said, we, um, we, we are both affiliated or at least we, we, we used to be affiliated with the European University Institute. Um, right now, uh, I am uh, uh, working at the Max Planck Institute for, for um, Comparative International Private in Hamburg. Um, Giovanni Sartor and Francesca are from the University of Bologna. And Agnieszka Jabłonowska is a Max Weber Fellow at the European Union. University Institute. And for uh, Francesca Lagioia and Giovanni Sartor, the, uh, the research that was uh, embedded, included in the paper, uh, has, been, has been founded, has been supported by the ERC uh, grant. So to start with, um, when we think about algorithms in the consumer economy, uh, the first question is why algorithms are a problem and why we should think about uh, transparency as a separate area of, of, of investigation, a separate area of, of building some 
conceptual or, or policy regulation related solutions. So um, definitely in, in this sphere, and this is perhaps one of the most distinct and, and most, most conspicuous features of this sphere, um, we experience a very significant overlap between, on the one hand, the classical consumer problems, such as the problem of the price for the particular good or service, the problem of how particular products are ad advertised to the consumer, how consumers targeted with the particular types of commercial speech from a firm. Uh, secondly, uh, the problems which are related to the digital consumer concerns. So for example, the use of particular online services, the operation of platforms such as Amazon or Uber, uh, the question of uh, the use of consumer data as some kind of a commodified object. And thirdly, of course, the question of protection of data and protection of privacy, which right now is mostly uh, encapsulated in the GDPR. However, as I will try to say in a minute, uh, there are also some um, elements of this, of this attitude of this, uh, let's say, privacy uh, focus in the proper consumer law um, parts of the, of the um, European Union law. Um, what is also important when we think about the algorithms in the, in, the, in the consumer economy is that apart from these classical consumer problems, such as the problem of price, such as the problem of advertising, uh, the vast majority of issues that emerge in this sphere are the issues which somehow involve the question of uh, the use or misuse of, of, of data, and which also so involves some values related to, to, to privacy. It can be privacy as such. This can be also some other considerations or some other values considering the private sphere of a consumer, the oneself um, of a consumer as, as, as a market actor. And finally, while talking about the um, transparency and algorithms as such, we uh, in the paper, we distinguish between two types of opacity to times of non-transparency with relation to algorithms. And uh, first of all, we talk about the um, technology-based uh, opacity, which is the a feature of the, of, the, of the algorithm, which makes this algorithm uh, impregnated for the analysis and understanding in terms of its technological design. So this kind of, kind of non-transparency, this kind of opacity is mostly related to the experts, is mostly related to uh, those who can come to the algorithm and can, can try to investigate the algorithm using some uh, expert specialized knowledge on, 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 on the IT technology. Whereas the relational technology, which in fact is the core of the consumer problem um, with relation to algorithms. Uh, the relational opacity, the relational um, non-transparency is the uh, opacity which relates to the way how individuals who are somehow involved in the algorithmic processing of, of data, who are subjected to the decisions made by the algorithms or to the assessment made by, made by the algorithms, can understand why particular decision was made, what were the premises of this decision, of this decision and what was the final outcome of the, of the operation of the algorithm. And um, then when we, um, when we move into, let's say more precise inquiry of how algorithms can be, can be uh, made more transparent, more accessible on the consumer market, um, first of all, of course, what we, what, we, what we experience here, and this comes without saying perhaps, uh, is that the uh, consumer market, as many other parts of the, of the digital society relations, it clearly, uh, clearly undermines the, the, this utopian promise that many people tended to believe at the outset of the, of the, of the internet or at at the, at the outset of, of, of some early uh, AI and algorithm-based technologies, that algorithms and this very sophisticated, very developed techniques for, for analysis of data can in fact empower individuals. Quite the opposite, as we can see in many parts of the, of the society and market nowadays, and we, as we can see in the consumer market, especially perhaps, 
Um, algorithms and the algorithmic analysis of data is in fact a vehicle of building power. So those who have more resources, those who have who can who can, who can gain more, more knowledge, those who can uh, construe more uh, detailed, better functioning algorithms can in fact gain power over those who do not have such resources, such knowledge, such, such possibilities. And from this perspective, um, when we think about, about transparency as the possible answer to this question, so as uh, of transparency as the possible answer to the uh, consumer problem uh, in the sphere of, of, of algorithmic decision making, we may try to rationalize transparency in two terms. So, so first of all, we may think about transparency in more classical terms. And uh, classically in, in uh, consumer law, and this is both the European approach, but also we can, we can trace many, many elements of this approach. For example, in the US consumer law, uh, transparency is understood as uh, the situation where consumers are supplied with information about particular particular details of the transaction about the particular premises of the market choice and where consumers can being supplied with this information can understand this information and can make an informed decision whether or not to enter a particular transaction whether to or not to make a particular market choice and of course here we trace we 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 face many uh, well known problems especially the question of the information overflow and um, the problem of the cognitive constraints of consumers who even if are supported with with lots of information with enough information to understand the transaction can lack time can lack attention can lack understanding in order to fully comprehend what is what is uh, communicated to them and therefore thinking about transparency in the context of, alg of algorithms you may try to devise new type of transparency, or at least the new approach towards the question of transparency, which would be more targeted and which, which would be more specific for the algorithmic decisions made vis-a-vis -vis, uh, consumers. And again, in this, in this sphere, um, we may um, first of all look into how, how the situation has been has been uh, resolved or how uh, what were the attempts to resolve this situation uh, in the EU law and um, although for a long time the EU law seemed to be quite oblivious to, to the question of, of to the problem of uh, data processing of uh, to at least to to, 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 to to acknowledging that data can provide a separate sphere of consumer problems and can and can uh, provide a separate uh, area for abuse of consumers or for, for exploiting the market power of firms vis-a-vis -vis consumers. Right now, for the past two or three years at least, the European Union has been invested a lot of regulatory and intellectual effort into, first of all, understanding, and secondly, into regulating the sphere, into somehow constraining the operation of algorithms. And um, in so doing, European Union is trying to, first of all, protect individual consumers who are subjected to decisions made by the algorithms. So for example, who are subjected to targeted advertising, who are subjected to information, who, who are subjected to, to personalized pricing. Um, but secondly, uh, the EU law aims also to protect um, collective consumer interests and, and seeking to protect consumers as the community, as the group, as a part, as a, as a social cluster in a way. And in this way, European Union is trying in particular to uh, safeguard that consumer information will be processed in the way that will not infringe consumer privacy and that will provide uh, each consumer with autonomy vis-a-vis -vis his or her uh, own data. And in this sphere, um, European Union law seems to build on the, on the I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I will have, have to close my window. Yes, I'm very sorry for this, for this, uh, for this outside noise. 
uh, like something happened on the street. But um, coming back to to to, uh, to the uh, EU regulatory approach, uh, the European Union is trying to build on uh, on the one hand on the idea of transparency, but at the same time the approach of the EU law seems to be rather classical in terms of the uh, conceptual premise. Because here uh, also the European Union law, as it is right now, uh, seems to perceive transparency as the consequence of providing consumers with enough data about the operation of the algorithm, about the fact that the particular algorithm is utilized in the consumer formulation and so far. And uh, mm, here, transparency is understood as it is understood in, uh, in most of the other areas of EU law as both substantive transparency, so the situation where cons consumers are informed about operation of the algorithms, but also in procedural terms, in more formal terms, so the situation where, so the state, when the information communicated to consumers is, uh, is, uh, is not vague, is, is, is easily comprehensible for consumers, is not blurred in any way. And- um, sorry, uh, sorry, Mateus, uh, uh, can you start wrapping up? There is- Yes, a... yes, yes. The, yeah, these are you. just my, 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 my last, my last uh, two, uh, two slides. So the elements of this, of this, of this attitude um, can be traced especially in the in the recent reform of EU law of 2018-19 of EU consumer law where uh, some elements of the of the uh, of the rules related to algorithms were introduced into several parts of the, of the um, EU consumer law including for example the obligation to disclose to consumers that a particular price has been personalized upon them and here uh, in the 2011-83 Directive on Consumer Rights, we have right now a clear obligation like this, which, which is again based on this classical notion, classical concept of, of, of consumer, of consumer um, transparency. And um, in, uh, with, with this in mind, we, um, we first of all, in our paper, try to, try to uh, analyze process and cons of this of this of this attitude. So uh, first of all, we try to identify the possible advantages of, of, of uh, the model of, of, of transparency that has been adopted in EU law. And uh, secondly, we also try to identify some trade-offs that are that are uh, associated with this sphere. So first of all, this is the question of, of um, the transaction costs and uh, the obligation to disclose some data which can be somehow commodified or which can which can uh, which can represent some market value to the to the firms that develop this data for example that developed particular algorithms or that developed particular other IT techniques and finally there is also a clear tra trade-off between the transparency and the accuracy of data because uh, tra transparency and the accuracy of algorithms um, there is some evidence that indicates that the most accurate algorithms are also the most non-transparent algorithms. So if we try to increase the transparency of, of the algorithm, very often we have to pay in terms of the effectiveness and accuracy of this, of this, of this problem. And um, um, to, to, to conclude, to wrap, to wrap it up, we think that, in, and then this is the, the claim that we are trying to make in our paper, that the current um, EU approach towards, towards regulation of, trans, of, of, of algorithms on the, on the consumer market is um, a missed opportunity to address this problem upfrontly and in the, in the efficient way. Um, first of all, because it builds on the very classical notion of the, of the consumer, um, consumer transparency. Secondly, because it misses to, 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 to a large extent the possibility that's created by explainability of algorithms. So, so EU law seems to be rather oblivious to the, to, the, to the problem that it's not only the question that consumer is informed about the use of algorithms, but also that consumer can understand how particular algorithm can, can uh, operate and why particular, particular decision has been made to this consumer. So here, this whole dimension of explainability is missing. And finally, there is also a clear lack of the enforcement framework because the EU law 
does not provide any enforcement tools, any precise enforcement tools, and leaves this question entirely to the member states uh, where the enforcement schemes are decentralized and at least at the current point, not always very effective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mateusz, and, and thank you for all your co-authors uh, as well. Uh, we are a tiny bit uh, uh, um, uh, behind the schedule, so I think we are moving directly to our next presentation, which is, I think, is presented by, by Stefan. I don't think your, your uh, co-authors are, are present. Um, so uh, it's going to be um, Stefan Larsson from Lund University, Technology and Social, uh, Social Change. And then his co-authors were not present, uh, Fredrik Heinz from Linköping University, Computer Science, and Anders Jenser Ustad from datashoot.net. Uh, um, and their uh, theme is notified but unaware third party tracking online. So please, uh, Stefan. Thank you. Uh, I think I took over your screens now. I guess, yeah. I, I guess it's uh, it's we're in in um, Central Europe, so uh, Sweden, and uh, I mean time wise, that's why it's six p.m. in the in the evening on a Friday. So I think uh, it's hard for some sometimes to to be be in in this time of the week. But anyways, um, this uh, article is very much. Um, Empirically, empirically driven. So we, we, we map third parties and we um, also show that those results for people in focus groups. So uh, a combination of quantitative and qualitative sort of studies and not so much the theory driven, but a few concepts around transparency. And uh, you see there's a report in, in the back uh, and that's the Swedish competition authorities. Uh, that's sort of start, that's where it started. So, so in terms of transparency, this is also an attempt not to show you know, the value of data, but sort of that there are markets dealing with data collection uh, that, that are obscuring themselves. So from a supervisory authority perspective, they don't see them, I make that claim sort of. Uh, they need to be better at that. So this is a way to, to just show the third party tracking markets in a sense. And yeah, and Andres and Friedrich has already been presented, but much of this has been uh, we, we we were able to do it through the work of uh, it says data it's like data protection NGO they have developed a tool to map third parties basically um, so we mapped and uh, and have uh, we had made samples out of five different sectors because we sort of have the hypothesis that uh, different sectors were differently you know intertwined with third parties of course, and we can see that in many other studies, but it would be kind of nice, and there aren't many Swedish studies uh, on third parties. So, you know, the difference between public sector and um, um, retail, for example, or so, uh, we lumped insurance and banking together for some reasons. And health is also an interesting sector because it's partly private, partly public. And if you link it to ad tech, it could be pretty sensitive data traveling uh, from health uh, web. Uh, pages. So, and then we compared or showed these, show, we, we, we were showing these results for uh, participants to sort of understand more of, yeah, how much do you know, individual users or consumers or visitors of web pages, uh, you know, understand or navigate or sort of um, handle their cookie, cookie uh, consent uh, questions and stuff like that. So the questions are pretty <clears throat> Empirical in a sense. So, uh, what 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 trackers are present? Just sort of we we wanted to just map it, and what so what types of third party trackers? Which you don't really you don't see it on the actual tracking, but you uh, can compare to lists that others have created, so you can figure out the purpose of the tracking. Because then you would know if it's is it you know uh, ad tech or is it um, uh, analytics or is it something else. Um, and then, of course, it's interesting to see the different sectors use or like the linkage between third party uh, ad tech and different sectors, for example. And then um, <clears throat> asked uh, more sort of qualitative questions to consumers than the last two. So um, 
that the, the small amount of theory you could say that's in uh, in the paper comes from uh, earlier work of mine on uh, and, and Frederick on sort of the concept of transparency. And we talked we talked about that before, but sort of um, trying to just map different dynamics of transparency. And in this paper, we use primarily three angles. Uh, one of which, you know, sort of there's a body of work doing um, uh, studies on the complexity of commercial data ecosystems like um, uh, for example Frank Pascali's Black Box Society book or uh, um, uh, Crystal's uh, report from three years ago on sort of okay what parties are present and how is data shared on markets that consumers don't see uh, and of course aspects of proprietorship or that that the data is entering domains that are partly owned um, uh, is an aspect we look we were looking for uh, too and also the literacy sort of the human understanding or information literacy aspect of it uh, that i mentioned also in the panel before um, i'm not gonna explain much about third-party tracking but uh, it's it, it could be at least sort of uh, necessary to say, okay, there are many functionalities. You could do many different things with cookies and cookies don't even have to be, uh, you know, a file placed on your browser. It could be also be, uh, there are different sort of technologies being developed and fingerprinting is one where you can detect or uh, individually um, uh, identify uh, visitors without even placing anything on their computers. So the important distinction here is, um, the first party and third party. So from a human user perspective, you tend to very much understand the first party. So you go to a media site reading about, I don't know, maple leaves in the NHL in this context. Uh, but the third parties, you know, that page, that site, who are they interacting with? Where are your data used in what sort of uh, commercial practices? That's very hard for from a human consumer uh, Point of view. So, so third party, first party distinction is very important. But this is a uh, yet another very complex image. I, I I'm taking it from Michael Veal and Frederick Söderven Borges' work uh, as a recent paper on just to show that yeah, for parts of the ad tech market, it's about real time bidding. Uh, and the interesting part is that from a human consumer perspective, you are the visitor of of this you know, media site writing about, writing about maple leaves. And that's sort of the relationship you're really aware of. But if it's, if this sort of interaction is part of, of, of a real time bidding um, scheme, then you have lots of other sort of structures behind uh, and also many parties that could sort of place bets on this uh, central ad exchange, all of which being done very quickly and I assume most of you, uh, you know, know roughly about those types of uh, markets, but it's the the idea here is sort of to to uh, show how co how complex it can be, how automated it can be, and how uh, non transparent it can be. All you see is then the the sort of the winning auction, the winning bid for for what sort of ad should be placed on your browser when you read about the Maple Leafs. Uh, so a little bit briefly about the. Uh, types they can be used for what, what we were looking for. So ads and analytics. So for example, Google analytics or uh, content helping sort of functionality and show like, um, I don't know, YouTube videos, like this video being into another web page um, um, or other, there are some other types as well. Social would be more like um, yeah, Facebook included on a web page. Different sectors, we choose a sample of uh, we took, we, we had different ways to measure or, or to select the most um, popular uh, sites in media, retail, bank insurance, public sector and health. And as I said, this health is a combination of sort of new private versions and more old school public sector authority web, uh, which is a big distinction uh, in terms of uh, uh, third party, first party cookie uses. Um, and um, a little bit about results. I'm not going to show you that much of data, but some sort of overview imagery. Um, and Ida, you will help me with time, I assume. So I don't 
uh, steal too much time from your presentations. But you see here uh, the number of unique third parties uh, that's contacted on average on web pages in each sector. So you see, for example, in media, that's the most unique third party um, cookies used. The third parties are mostly engaged in media sites. And then the second, uh, the runner up, so to speak, that's also very much linked to, to third parties is the retail sites. And then less so, and the least so in the public sector, which was sort of uh, expected. And I'm also kind of happy to see that the public sector is not deeply engaged with ad tech, for example, because that would mean that every public sector web we would visit would sort of use us to get revenue. Uh, and that sort of uh, uh, mix uh, would be problematic. Uh, this looks pretty complex, but uh, uh, look for colors here. Um, for example, advertising, the blue one. You see, uh, you see basically how much of the ad third parties are, uh, are linked to different sectors. So media, all of the media websites had ad uh, tech third parties present. So all of them and uh, uh, large majority of retail. Uh, and then it's, it's at least in the public sector. But if you see analytics, which uh, does not have to be, I mean, everyone is using analytics in some way uh, or at least most. Uh, uh, so that's common also in the public sector and analytics doesn't have to be, it's more in the fine print if it's, if the data is traveling, if it's anonymized or if it's um, uh, interacting with advertising, you can, you can, you can have analytics tools to, to open up for advertising. And that's the choice of the web developer mostly. So it could be problematic, but it's not necessarily so. But then you also have the shrimps too, uh, on top of this, uh, making probably pretty many of the uses of Google analytics, for example, in Sweden on web pages. Well, problematic in terms of is it uh, legal or not? So that's that's one of the battles that's going to play out in the in the in the near future, I think. Um, looking at one of the sectors that would be uh, a media site. This is a regional newspaper. Uh, there are just a handful of those in in Sweden. Uh, this is the, from the area where I grew up. So the point here is to show maybe that. When you visit the first page of this regional newspaper, um, there's a lot of information sharing going on. So you get um, um, a link or a, like a question to ser servers outside the actual newspapers to all of these sort of uh, uh, third party parties. And the uh, point with the colors here is to show that in ad tech or in, in the ad uh, advertising markets, there's a lot of players involved uh, and not necessarily so in analytics. And that's also sort of from a, from a functional perspective that you don't have to have that many an, an, an analytics tools. You just need uh, you know one good. But uh, in terms of ads, that could be the real time bidding uh, that is shown here that you have a lot of, you have like sub markets bidding on to show ads for your little visit here. Uh, the last sort of uh, quant uh, empirical slide is this, because because the talk is is easy to talk about the big ones like um, Google and, and ad tech, right, or Facebook and ad tech. And true, they are uh, um, very present on all of these sectors. Um, and in, in this uh, particular one, you see that they are the most common. But uh, but you also have like a long sort of tail of other types of third parties, which I think is interesting. And it's important to show that too, that it's not just it's not just the big ones. There are also many that are not so known from a consumer point of view. So that's also the link that uh, it's very hard for a consumer to understand the, 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 the amount, but it's also hard to understand, okay, who's bid switch and what's click on a metrics and who's the Delta projects. You know, it's like, how would you, how would you even comprehend where your data, how it's used if you don't even, you know, if it's 50 different types of players going on. Um, one slide on the uh, sort of uh, focus groups and, and as you already could understand, uh, um, 
they in general don't they don't feel that they really have a control or really understand uh, how the data is collected, what type of data is collected and what it's used for, and very little so for third party uses. Uh, the one, um, uh, for example, the cookie consent agreement or like the, 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 the um, consent dialogue is particularly so no one really feels that they, they really engage or take a, like a, a informed decision in it. Uh, and there's one difference which is interesting is also that because we do, we screened and divided them from those who who claim to be high trust versus those who claim to be low trust in sharing data, and neither of them uh, said that they they felt like they had control or understood. But one group didn't worry about it, the high trusters, and the other group felt much more anxiety and wanted to. They wished it was different, but they didn't have the uh, they didn't feel that they could change it. So that's also an interesting sort of implication. And then to sum it up, then um, and. Um, Looking at the time, four points to sum it up. So, and this is sort of empirically, uh, it, it's not novel and we've seen it in other studies, but we've seen it more in sort of US studies and uh, some pan-European, like Stine Lomborg had a good article last year on, on sort of European countries uh, and not so many Swedish. So it's been good for us to do it locally and so to speak also in Sweden. Uh, so there's a lot of- Stefan, sorry. <laughs> That's just, oh, you can okay. speed it up a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this has already been said. Um, it plays a, like a commercial role, right? It's good to to just to just state it, and primarily for for supervisory authorities who doesn't really know how to deal with is the you know does the data have a value, and how should we assess stuff like uh, um, mergers uh, and and another sort of implications of that data plays this commercial role. It's not new, but it's it needs to be sort of restudied, um, and especially so media and retail sectors, of course. And the last sort of more of um, what we want to tell, not telling every individual to be more aware here, but more sort of, and not saying that the lawmakers should change the laws. It's more the the result would be more like, yeah, there are stuff going on, and supervisory authorities could be more active in sort of supervising they could map more they could have different tools and also have a different set of competences to actually just study the markets going on because uh, at the moment uh, and the way i perceive it also maybe particularly in the swedish sort of uh, supervisory uh, setting uh, they struggle with that they don't really know uh, in a sense worst case what's going on and they also struggle in between competition consumer and data protection. And, and that sort of silo structure is not necessarily good for uh, the human individual perspective. So thanks. Thank Next you so speaker. much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stefan and, and, and all the, all the co-authors. It was nice to have an empirical paper too, after all the, all the theoretical presentations. Uh, and now we are going to our penultimate uh, uh, presentation which will be by uh, Professor Mark Fester from the University uh, of, of Florida uh, and his topic will be a, a public journey through COVID-19, Donald Trump, Twitter and the secrecy of US president's health. Mark, please. Thank you, Ida. I am going to try to share my screen. Ah, now I see why I'm not choose. Uh, okay, I'm going to try one more time. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, then I'm going to give up, and that will be okay. All right, I am going to give up. Uh, so uh, no worries, you get to see more of me, uh, unless Donald Trump, which is probably for the best for everyone anyway. Uh, so um, uh, the paper describes the week-long spectacle of President Trump's uh, illness, former President Trump's illness with COVID, um, something that I'm going to assume to an extent reached some degree of international uh, penetration, uh, but was obviously a key issue uh, in the U.S. Both in terms of understanding COVID and also in the midst of a, uh, excuse me, in the midst of a presidential election um, that he ultimately lost. Um, it was uh, uh, this paper doesn't fit in 
uh, quite as um, uh, quite as immersively with the topic of uh, the uh, uh, of the journal issue, uh, but because it uh, extensively took place on social media, uh, it had a significant relationship uh, with uh, digital transparency, uh, and it was uh, revealing of lots of things uh, to know about uh, what transparency means currently. Um, so. This fits into a couple of different projects and sort of follows on a couple of different projects that I've been working on over the last 10 or 15 years. One of them is, uh, is a broader critique of transparency uh, and the legal and political frustrations that accompany transparency's incomplete implementation and enforcement. Um, so that ultimately got summarized in a book that I published in 2017. But then more recently, I've done uh, uh, a longer law review article on transparency's relationship with populism. Um, transparency is obviously a, uh, both a, a, a form of public administration, but it's also deeply political. Uh, and its relationship with the uh, currently prevailing uh, of, uh, right wing populisms of the United States and of India and of other countries that have seen a rise. And even in the United States without uh, President Trump, a sort of resurgence of right wing populism. Um, raises questions of what is the relationship between populism and transparency. Uh, and the, the argument that I make in that piece is that transparency is both a failure uh, in the sense that it is a, um, uh, it can't hold uh, accountable a, a regime that resists it. Uh, it has limits in terms of its implementation and enforcement authority. Uh, but it also is triumphed insofar as the discourse of transparency was, has, is very much a part of right-wing populism. Uh, and uh, uh, President Trump claimed to be transparent. His uh, followers uh, described him as transparent, <clears throat> which simply begs the issue of what does transparency mean uh, if someone doesn't comply with uh, laws and norms uh, and yet can claim to be transparent? Uh, what, is, uh, uh, what does transparency as a concept mean? Uh, mean. So I use the, uh, I use the invitation that he uh, sent, uh, sent out as a way of thinking through uh, more specifically uh, how, tr how uh, Trump and right-wing populism uh, in a general sense uses transparency, what they mean by it, uh, what their followers mean by it. Um, and so uh, what I'm gonna do, what I do in this piece is uh, 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 use the, the moment of COVID, the big, basically Trump's a week long, uh, COVID illness as a way of thinking through his use of Twitter in particular, um, but social media more generally as a way of making a claim to be uh, transparent and, and how it was that he used that. Um, so I, I connected to larger question of uh, to what extent are political leaders required to disclose uh, their, their personal health. Um, and in the United States, it's not very much. And I talk about this a bit, uh, a bit, uh, a bit in the article, uh, but the laws don't extend very deeply other than to the extent to which they either die uh, or uh, are disabled, so disabled that they can't uh, continue to, uh, 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 to do the duties of their office. Um, but anything short of that uh, is ripe for obfuscation and secrecy. And on the, along the long history of the American presidency, um, there has been a great deal of that, uh, 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 troublingly on both the, the, the sort of liberal left and on the right. Uh, so in that regard, the fact that Donald Trump was not particularly transparent about his own health uh, from the very beginning of uh, his campaign, where he released a letter uh, characterizing himself uh, from his personal physician, characterizing himself as the healthiest individual ever to run for the presidency, uh, which we later learned was in fact dictated by President Trump himself to his physician, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly. Uh, from that all the way through COVID, uh, uh, the information about Trump's health was, all, uh, was always uh, under tight control. Um, in terms of his uh, willingness to comply with the norms and laws of transparency, his compliance with the law, with, with open government laws, was below the norm and certainly below the norm of his predecessor, but, but was certainly not the worst, uh, particularly compared to um, uh, his, uh, uh, to George W. Bush, uh, especially post 9-11. Um, but in terms of his norms and the following the norms, and especially in terms of his personal wealth, uh, and conflicts of interest uh, with his uh, various businesses. 
uh, he was quite poor uh, in terms of disclosing information about, about himself. So that brings along the, uh, the issue of, uh, of COVID and he, you know, unsurprisingly announced his, um, his diagnosis of, uh, of infection uh, via Twitter. And over the course of a very short period of time, uh, a week, uh, we went from uh, various tweets and videos that were presented on Twitter and on Facebook, uh, showing him admitted to the hospital, uh, showing him disclose through uh, one tweet, a, you know, a deeply troubling uh, admission that um, he was in fact quite sick. Uh, in the midst of this, there were uh, press conferences uh, by the White House physician, by the, by the president's physician, uh, leaks that were going on uh, regarding uh, uh, leaks that were coming out of the White House and from uh, party officials about what was uh, what actually was occurring in the background. And his own tweets, uh, as he began apparently to recover, uh, he began, you know, sort of tweets that were politically, camp that, that were furthering his political campaign and damning his allies, uh, da uh, damning not his allies, but his adversaries uh, uh, from the hospital. Uh, various videos from the hospital showing him at work that were later revealed to be, he actually wasn't at work, he was just uh, performing uh, work that was not actually occurring. Um, and all leading to a uh, to various sort of weird triumphs of his uh, doing a motorcade from the hospital with a mask on uh, to wave to his supporters, and then ultimately being um, being dismissed from the hospital, taking the same helicopter back from the hospital to the White House, uh, and then triumphantly ripping off his mask as he appears uh, from the uh, from the White House portico, uh, and um, uh, never having a press conference, but producing videos demonstrating his uh, wellness, and then after only three or four days before uh, uh, discussing COVID as a plague, uh, once he defeated it. Uh, he said, don't worry about COVID anymore. Uh, and then ultimately uh, stating that his physician had said, not only had he uh, triumphed over the disease and no longer had it, but he was now fully immune and couldn't pass it along anymore. A tweet that itself was uh, ultimately um, uh, not banned by Twitter, although he was ultimately banned by Twitter, but a warning was put on the tweet uh, saying that, uh, uh, declaring it a form of uh, misinformation. Uh, so in a, in a nutshell, uh, the episode demonstrated a lot about uh, President Trump uh, and his relationship to uh, social media as well as his relationship to transparency. So let me talk a bit about, uh, about that. Um, in a sense, what, uh, what, uh, what this reveals is uh, his general failure uh, and in terms of public administration with respect to uh, managing COVID uh, as well as uh, to uh, complying with a sort of legal set of, uh, a legal and normative set of expectations of what transparency would look like. Um, with respect to COVID, his administration failed on a number of different fronts uh, uh, and turned the issue of COVID into a political one rather than a public health crisis. Um, uh, uh, declaring it a political hoax while at the same time declaring it a part of a conspiracy uh, coming out of China, um, uh, hosting super spreading events uh, in the White House, uh, uh, one of which was probably the source of his infection, uh, uh, appearing at the federal uh, coronavirus task force, he would take it over, uh, spreading misinformation uh, uh, and contradicting public health officials, um, just generally acting in an unprofessional um, and uh, uh, incapable way uh, with, with respect to responding to the pandemic crisis uh, uh, as a form of political communication rather as a form of, rather as a consideration of public health. Um, at the same time, so he fails as a he fails in terms of transparency. But at the same time, there's an enormous amount of access, and I think this is the this to me is the interesting aspect of uh, his presidency. Also, obviously, is most most problematic. But as a scholar, I can say that it is an interesting aspect of his presidency. Um, the idea that one had full access uh, to his presidency in ways that you know uh, the his predecessor and the, the president who followed him are far more removed, uh, don't, use, uh, 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 don't use social media uh, in the way that he did. 
uh, in a sense, he at the same time rejected norms and laws of transparency in his administration, either rejected or downplayed it or tried to not to comply uh, with it. At the same time he was doing that, he was following ideas of transparency to the point of absurdity. That is, you knew in real time what was in the mind of the president, or at least you thought you knew. Uh, it was presented as being authentic and real. Um, it was in uh, uh, Andrea Nagel's uh, sense, who's uh, written on the alt-right and the, and the rise of Trump, uh, it revealed the, the absolute hegemony of a culture of nonconformism, uh, non of self-expression and of irreverence for its own sake. Um, uh, and that uh, was true of his social media, was true as well of his political rallies. Um, and in that way, in that way, in utilizing the, the sort of digital environment as a way of spreading misinformation, while at the same time presenting that misinformation is true by, uh, by uh, centering on, him, on himself and uh, the, the leader as, uh, as a personality, uh, rather than as the, the, the leader of a bureaucracy and of a public administration. It disfigured transparency. Uh, in uh, the political theorist Nadia Urbanati's uh, sense, um, it just it it didn't destroy it. It changed its uh, its uh, uh, its conceptualism uh, from an already imperfect uh, set of laws and norms uh, to something else, um, to something that his own uh, followers uh, deemed uh, authentic um, in in ways that a more technocratic ideal of conspiracy uh, of transparency uh, does not. Uh, does not offer. So ultimately, uh, to, just to sort of wrap up what, what to take away from this moment, um, uh, the, the episode reveals the, some of the conflicting characteristics of transparency uh, and how social media and, and a digital environment uh, help to, you know, in a sense, um, uh, further the contradictions, if you will, embedded within the concept of transparency. Um, uh, the way I characterize transparency in a, in a populist uh, moment is that there are two ways of understanding uh, transparency, two ways that transparency presents itself. Uh, one is technocratic, uh, uh, which, and I, and I feel as though this, the, the Trump moment both reveals the triumph of uh, transparency as a concept because he himself uh, utilizes the term and utilizes the concept but also its limitations, its limitations as a matter of law uh, and uh, its limitation as an authority and as, an, as something to be enforced. Um, but in addition to the technocratic, uh, it's also political. Um, uh, uh, transparency is a concept that is available uh, and it's manipulable uh, 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 because it itself relies on an ideal of authenticity that, you know, to go back to the first papers from this morning, the notion of transparency is that it allows us to see, to see the real, uh, to see the real state. Uh, and that is, that is uh, not only relied upon by someone like Donald Trump, but it's relied upon by transparency advocates generally. Um, because in order to impose uh, and achieve a kind of technocratic ideal of transparency, you need a politics. Uh, you need laws, uh, you need enforcement agents that have legitimacy. Uh, and in order to achieve that, um, you need to be political. So the technocratic requires a sort of political authority. Uh, and, um, uh, and in a sense, the, the, the two are linked. Uh, we can't have the technocratic without the political and we can't have the political without the technocratic. Uh, and I think the, the, the ongoing um, uh, the ongoing conflict uh, uh, against, against right-wing populism and within right-wing populism is very much playing out in that way. Um, so, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. This was very, very fascinating. Uh, and you still had 26 seconds, so very, very well done. And it was also- I'll contribute uh, that, I'll contribute that. <laughs> Uh, that was very, very, very good, even though your, your slides uh, wouldn't work. There's always something like this happening in Zoom settings. So I think we all have, have been there that we have to, to play by the ear. Okay, today's uh, last but not least uh, presentation is just about to embark. So uh, welcome Katja de Vries. Uh, uh, Katja is from Uppsala University, uh, Sweden. And uh, Katja's um, uh, presentation is titled Transparent Dreams are made of this, counterfactuals as transparency tools in ADM. So please, Katja. 
Thank you very much. And now it will be exciting. I've never shared a screen on this laptop before. So let's give this a try. So can you? Yes, see this? We, we can see it. Just put it in the slideshow mode. And yes, uh, if I just try to move this uh, from the beginning. Now, now you should see the, the big screen. Yes, we can. Thank you. Excellent. The, the excitement. So uh, being the last one, now th this is a, is a challenge. Everybody is kind of tired and me, me too. But I've, uh, I've tried to include a lot, lots of pictures so that we keep, keep away. And uh, to, to help everybody, I thought I would uh, do a sneak preview of what I'm going to say. So that if people are really tired, then you know, stay awake for three minutes and then potentially you could sleep through the rest. So this is the sneak preview. I will, I will you know, give a short background, like a reading instruction to my paper, namely that I'm, I'm an assistant professor in public law, but I, I also studied philosophy and that is something that has been a recurrent theme throughout my research as well. And I think one of the things that really influenced me when, when I studied psychology, when I did psychology, when I researched uh, philosophy, is that I uh, became aware of that there are these kind of big words, and this is something that many of us have talked about today as well, the kind of the big words that kind of reveal the deep grammar of society, that kind of move you in ways that you actually would not like to think, but the words are in a way stronger than you are. And transparency is definitely one of them. It's there's this whole metaphysics of the light versus the dark, the truth versus lies, you know, the idea of revealing something. And it's such a seductive notion, transparency, that it's potential, it's it's almost impossible to resist it. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do in kind of the first part of my presentation. R resist the, the allure of transparency. And then here comes the white rabbit out of the head, is that I introduce something that is a bit counterintuitive. When we talk about transparency, we think that we talk about truth, about facts. But I propose that in if you actually want to be transparent, whatever that might mean, that you might actually be more transparent if you present, present speculation fantasies, if you present an, an alternate reality, what if explanations? And this is something that is known in the, in the discipline of history, where you basically speculate what would have happened if Hitler had won the war, which is one of the kind of maybe most famous counterfactual histories. But now, the, the idea is, can you use that more broadly to provide some kind of transparency? But then, no, when we are in a happy mood and we think this is this is excellent, let's go on with with counterfactuals. I I come with a, a kind of a new sad message, maybe that also when we talk about counterfactuals, there is again this big metaphys met metaphysical notions that might push us in thinking things that we maybe don't want to think, and that has to do with causality. The idea. Uh, which is known in, in, in popular media, like uh, the butterfly effect, that there is some one cause why things happen, an ultimate explanation that can be found. And again, I propose to resist that, to slow down again, and to, uh, to look, you know, can we unwrap that notion? So now everybody who's really tired can go, go, go to sleep, and I continue to, to talk. Because this is, in fact, something that I did not reveal in my sneak preview. I'm not talking about transparency and counterfactuals in, a, in an abstract manner. No, in my day-to-day -day life as a researcher, I think a lot about uh, automated decision-making. And the question of transparency is applied to, to that automated decision-making. And there is, there is this image which is very known, which is kind of captures the, the, the problem that many experience with automated decision-making, this completely uninterested woman 
that there is this guy coming with a certain request and the, the woman enters all kinds of things in the computer and then she says, computer says no, which is kind of the representation of a black box system that simply says no. Well, to, to go in a bit deeper, you could say that automated decision-making is about sorting things out. You know, how can you have a rule that sorts out things, terrorists from non-terrorists, good creditors from bad creditors, uh, cancer from healthy bodies, etc. It's about sorting things out. And one, one way to, uh, to put such a rule uh, in, a, uh, in a computer is to kind of top down tell a computer this is the rule. So what we see here is the algorithm that was used in a scandal that, that happened last summer in the UK. It was the algorithm that was used to make grading decisions. Of course, as you know, there was the COVID pandemic uh, uh, last year. Students in high school could not uh, sit through their exams. So an algorithm was used to make an estimate of what grades they would have gotten if they had been actually doing the exam. And this, this was you know, somebody who thought, well, which factors would be interesting and who wrote this algorithm. Uh, this, this led to outrage. Uh, people don't like it if, if an algorithm decides what probably would have been your outcome. And moreover, it was very problematic because it turned out uh, that the algorithm thought, well, bad schools normally produce bad students. So uh, uh, the, the, the rich schools, uh, normally the, the students in the rich schools got on average better estimates than people who attended uh, socially uh, uh, schools with a less less privileged socioeconomic state. So then next to this, so th this was still simple, simple algorithm. You have the machine learning that also some of my, uh, my other panelists uh, talked about where you basically don't, you, you don't program the rule top down. No, you actually, you feed examples into a computer and then you give a rule how the computer can extract a rule from that which makes it even more complex. The, the rules become very incomprehensible, often, not always, but often. Uh, and this even uh, forces that question of transparency even more. But now I, I am going back to what I already talked about in my sneak preview. So somehow in this situation, you feel that every, everything is driving you to the point that you want to say, okay, what we need is transparency. But why? Why transparency? So in this situation, if we think you know, that this is maybe the, the UK government uh, telling you what your uh, estimated grade is, and the, the woman says, no, your grade is not good enough to go to Oxford. What kind of transparency is needed then? And something that, that Ida talked about also when she was presenting Monica's paper, is that if, if we don't talk about the details, it's very easy to get in this uh, uh, transparency whitewashing mood. So I always think if I fail in academia, this is how I will make my money. Yeah? I will sell transparency seals, right? So yeah, no worries, we check this. But now if we go into more detail, uh, as a lawyer, uh, I think, then one of the first places to look is the GDPR. And the GDPR, the transparency is mentioned like 50 times in the text and often not very much elaborated, but there is this concept that has been attributed to the, to the GDPR, even though it's not very explicitly in it, namely profile transparency that when uh, 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 automated decision-making is uh, applied to you, uh, that you should be provided with meaningful information about the logic involved and about the significance and the envisaged consequences, which already seems to be a bit more uh, specific. However, I will uh, go, go fast. Um, if, if we put that aside for a moment and think, okay, ADM, what are the problems that transparency potentially could give an answer to? 
well. Then there, there are three, three problem areas that you could identify. You could say, maybe if we could have some kind of transparency, we could see systemic problems of discriminatory bias, uh, or we, uh, we have a problem that there are decisions with significant consequences that lack an appropriate justification if something has a huge impact on your life, like for instance, a grading decision and which university you can attend, then you would expect at least some kind of explanation. And also the, uh, the problem that if you just are in this computer says no situation, that there is this objectif objectification that you, you, uh, there, you're, there's just a label applied to you and you cannot as a subject really respond to that in an adequate way. So these three, three areas, there you could say that transparency at some, in some way potentially could play a role. And you can categorize these, uh, these, uh, these problem areas roughly in two groups. So you can say uh, there are issues at a systemic level, at a global level where a global explanation is needed, a global explanation of the whole system. And then you have uh, issues that have to do with more on an individual level. What, uh, what kind of information should be provided to the individual that apply particularly to that person? This is a bit abstract. So here, because I'm the last one, I entered uh, this, uh, this image to keep you awake. So this is Job. Now we are getting a bit biblical and very bad things happen to Job because Satan and God had a little argument there. Uh, and what Job needed is clearly a local explanation. He didn't, he, he was a very good guy and bad things happened to him. So he wonders, you know, why, why me? Why is this happening? And is there something that I can do? Because it was completely unclear what he was doing wrong. Eh? He was clearly missing out on something. So what I'm focusing on is with ADM, local explanations, which are individual, why me? And that are somehow actionable, that allow you to do something. And if you think what kind of transparency would provide a local explanation, individual transparency that is actionable, what is that? Well, this is where my white rabbit comes in again, counterfactual transparency. And first, I, I have to oppose that. So if we, uh, uh, the, the kind of the more classical forms of transparency, you could say is if we go back to that computer says no situation, you could say, okay, let's open the, the, the lid of that computer. Let's see how it looks inside. Or you look at the source code, or you look at how a model has been trained. And the problem there is that it's, it's very complex. You could also say to the woman behind the computer, could you give me kind of the summary explanation of what's going on? But there you have the problem that things might become too simplified, yeah? a layman's sentence. So here you see the, the algorithm to, of the, that was underlying the, the UK grading scandal. Very simple algorithm, but still rather complex to the normal, uh, normal person. Or here you have the, the, the municipality of Amsterdam that, uh, uh, that is now together with, uh, with the municipality of Helsinki participating in an, uh, in an algorithm register projects where they try to be transparent about the algorithms that they use. And there you see very basic explanations. Basically, we use an algorithm to find people who commit housing fraud. And that's basically the explanation. It's not more than indicating that they are using such an algorithm, which is not individual at all, not actionable, uh, nor is that algorithm there very individual or actionable. So in 2018, Sandra Wachter from Oxford University wrote this, uh, this article about counterfactual explanations that had a lot of impact, I would say, that was picked up by, uh, by a quite a, a large audience, which said, OK, well, let's think. When we talk about transparency, let's first think, how is it that we humans provide transparency? in day-to-day -day situations. And I, I picked the UK grading example, not just because it's a recent example, but also because I, as an assistant professor, 
uh, one of the things that I do in my day-to-day -day work life is that I grade students. So I, this is something that I uh, have to think about quite a lot in my day-to-day uh, -day life. Uh, if a student comes to me and says, I'm not happy with my grade, uh, explain to me why did I get this grade? That's not always very easy to defend. There are a lot of uh, procedural rules that I follow and there are procedures uh, and that's good. Uh, so I have to say to Rika, Rika is not here anymore, but procedures are excellent. But still, it's not necessarily true that there always is one explanation. And Gata, you are uh, running out of time, so can you wrap it up, please? Thanks. Yes, I, uh, can I have two more minutes? Two more minutes? So a, a brain scan is not going to help. So here comes the counterfactual. The counterfactual says, now we are going to look at what minimum change would have led to another decision. And this is normally what students want to know. Students say, uh, uh, what should I change in order to get a different grade? So now, in the, over the last three, four years, computers have become quite a, kind of good to creating alternate but convincing realities. Uh, these are cases of people that do not exist, and they uh, are, are convincing. So now the question is, can you use algorithmic creation of alternate realities to provide transparency? Well, now the good thing about counterfactuals is that you go away from this idea that you have to reveal some kind of reality uh, and it uh, uh, is much closer to how we explain things as humans between each other. Um, however, the problem is that when, I, when I'm confronted with a student who says, tell me what I should have done different, then there is a whole array of things often that the student could have done different. I could say, well, if you, your language and your structure would have been a bit different combined with this, then you probably would have gotten this grade. But there are, there's a multiplicity of different explanations. And this is what, you, what, uh, what happens in the film Rashomon, where you have the same event that is explained by different people and all explanations fit. Now I'm really, I'm going to have like half a minute, if you throw all these different explanations at somebody, that's maybe not really helpful. You have information overload. You might actually reveal the, the model, which you don't want to do. But if you're going to select among those explanations, you also have a problem because you have to make very normative decisions, exactly as in content moderation. Which, which explanations are actually, actually actionable? How are you going to select that? And if you are telling that an uh, that one, uh, you might say, you have to uh, cite more Erwin Goffman in your essay to get a good grade, but then the student does that, and then the whole structure of the text is ruined, and the student still gets a bad grade. So what I want to say is the counterfactual is promising, but it has to be very contextualized and very much uh, 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 be applied to the particulars of the situation. And we really have to think about what does an individual need in a particular situation. Thank you. Thank you, Katja. That was uh, very fascinating. And, and uh, I think it was very, <laughs> definitely kept us, kept us awake. There is a, uh, we had a long, a uh, long session already. I think we're all a little bit tired and a little bit Zoom zombies. Uh, uh, however, we have about 15 minutes time for Q&A. Uh, and uh, so please just uh, uh, raise your hand and, and let's have this discussion. In particular, I want to, to also, uh, also hear uh, views from Agnieszka and, and Francesca. Is Francesca still here? Uh, it would be nice to hear as you, you also as a co-authors uh, of, of your views. Um, well, if I can start speaking out, or should I put my hands up? <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Uh, 
Go ahead. Sorry, and first of all, thanks for, for having us and for, for this kind of invitation. And I'm sorry if I'm not only tired, but also a bit faint after a vaccine earlier today. So it's a double <laughs> problem today. But um, it was still extremely interesting for me to participate in this session precisely because I've noticed there are quite some elements of overlap between the different papers and presentations. So uh, when I was listening to, listening to the last one, I think the idea between global and local explanation and uh, in, in, in individual and actionable, this is exactly what we were also looking at. And perhaps also trying to link it in more to the to the regulatory developments in the EU and see wh where the focus lies. And it doesn't seem to lie on, on what uh, you have described as, as as what the consumer or an individual needs. So I think it was very um, interesting for me to to see that that these uh, kind of intellectual. Um, studies they go in a similar di direction but yet when you look at the regulatory developments uh, this doesn't really find a lot of reflection and actually the uh, proposal for, for AI regulation is another uh, example of of what the, the uh, lawmaker seems to be missing so there is uh, essentially no individual dimension there aside from a very limited transparency duty and also at a very general level. So from my perspective, it was just extremely interesting to see that, that, that these discussions go in a really similar directions. And, and I think there is still a lot of potential for this more in-depth research as you have been uh, now presenting, um, Katya. So thank you for that. And, and I, I would just like to 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 and generally thank for the um, uh, for the organization and uh, uh, declare that we are also probably all interested in continuing this in, in future uh, research. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. I hope I I, I pronounced your name correctly. <laughs> um, uh, I saw uh, Francesca. Do you do you want to say something? Are you are you there? <laughs> Or, or are you just a, a screen? If, 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 if not, I, I, I saw Stefan's hand uh, up, at least. Yeah, yeah. Just more of a question, um, maybe to Katya. First of all, I love your title of the, and I also, I also like that we saw a job standing there. Like, give me counterfactual indications. I need something. But uh, no, I was thinking more vaguely, like um, because your your example with um, explaining human decision making. Uh, um, has its, uh, of course, its sort of challenges. But uh, when you refer to credit assessment and st stuff like that, it's more tends to be more scaled, a different scale. You could have like ten thousand decisions over a half an hour. So how do you merge that? Is it the scalability of uh, automated decision making? How much does that scalability pose an additional challenge? I'm not sure if you already. I may have missed that link, but sort of it's so different from individual to the great multitude of automation. Please cut so, so can you, uh, so what do you mean with the credit decision here? Because I can see that the, what you talked, I, I, by the way, I also loved your paper and I love the images in your paper about all the, the ad decisions that are made, but there in, in relation to your paper, I can see it, that you have this enormous multi multitude of very quick decisions that are uh, that are made. Um, are you referring to those kind of? Yeah, yeah, I was sort of aiming because uh, I, I, the way I expect Ellie sort of understood your presentation, it was more like we have this, uh, well, obscure, hard to explain type of decision making, and it could be both human and automated. But the automated, yeah, maybe I'm sort of biased from that, uh, you know, ad tech, real time bidding market because I just talked about it. So then you have like uh, hundreds of uh, players for one visit only. And then in picturing, you have uh, 5,000 visitors to that. And then you have like the multitude. So it's like, it's like a wave of automated decision making. So you don't have any possibility to analyze each and every one. I don't know. It's, it's a different, so I'm just struggling with the scalability aspect of how would we deal with that? In terms yeah. of no, I, I, so I think in principle, in principle, you could uh, kind of uh, uh, create an, an alternate Katja who also who, who doesn't visit visit the, the newspaper of Jutebori but uh, visit the newspaper of Uppsala, and I'm sure that you could create an 
uh, and counterfactual with that. But I think that the bigger question that you have to ask before you ask the scalability and the, the, the kind of the quickness question is a question about the significance of the uh, decision. So in the GDPR, you have this distinction uh, that the Article 22 is related to decisions that have a significant impact or a legal impact. Uh, and I, uh, I assume that it does not apply, for instance, to most, uh, uh, most decisions of advertisements that are shown unless it's a very, very relevant ad that is shown. So I think that the, uh, uh, the use of counterfactuals would be mostly in uh, when it relates to significant decisions. And then I'm basically thinking so which kind of decision would be very, would happen on this massive scale very quickly? Um, and that's, I, I don't know, I can imagine that you, for instance, that you have kind of a, some medical device that is implanted that releases certain levels of sugar in your blood to keep you alive, something like that, where you have a multitude of decisions. Uh, and then to present a counterfactual, I don't know how useful that is. I mean, it's a, uh, no, as, as my conclusion was, the, the counterfactual can be useful, but it's not, a, it, it's not an answer to everything. And I think that in certain situations where decisions go at a massive scale and go quickly, you can use it, but probably in most, it's not so very useful. Thank you. Uh, we're a bit Thank short on time, so uh, let's collect uh, the last questions. I see uh, Mateus' uh, hands up, and then there is Francesca's question, which is in the chat. I will I will read it because it's also uh, um, uh, quite pertinent. It's, uh, Francesca is asking, my question is for Stefan. I'm curious to know, what do you think about the Google cohort mechanism to examine the behavior and performance of groups of users related by common attributes? Do you think it's more privacy compliant? compliant? What are the main risks? Uh, do you think uh, it is an issue under competition law? So there, there is a, a lot of, a lot, a lot to, to, to chew on there, but let's, uh, I, I will also uh, let, uh, no worries, Francesca. Uh, and then uh, uh, Mateus, uh, you had your hand up and please uh, keep it quite brief as we have only eight minutes uh, left. Yes, sorry. I yes, I, I I have been already speaking for too long today, so just a very short comment on the question. Because um, what really struck me when I was listening to the presentations in this second panel was um, how universal the question of transparency is, in the sense that um, our papers were coming from very different areas of the legal system, and so our paper was mostly related to private law. Some other papers were 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 uh, coming from elsewhere, but. I think the basic set of questions that we were trying to ask towards transparency and the basic set of problems that we, that we came across while thinking, conceptualizing transparency was more or less the same. And here comes my question to, 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 to Mark Fenster, because uh, like your presentation was perhaps the last one which I expected to have something in common with, with, with our paper. However, I surprisingly found a lot, uh, many, many overlaps between, between our thinking about transparency and, and, and your uh, argument, your, your, your approach. And um, here, um, here's my question, because in our paper, we're trying to talk also about the trade-offs. So what, can, what do we lose when we increase the degree of transparency? And can you maybe briefly expand on this? Because I, if I remember, you were, you were just tackling slightly upon upon these issues and in particular how do you how do you think um, we may in the democratic society resolve the trade-off between the public interest that stays behind uh, the transparency disclosure of, of health information about of, of public figures and the privacy right so the privacy of the particular individual who is taking the particular public office and for example the family some important ones who are, who are involved with, with this person Thank you. This so, is my question. Uh, okay, so uh, there was also a question in the in the chat, but I think we need to to unfortunately skip. And uh, I'm sorry, Beata Beata, who was asking the question in the chat, is my colleague from Helsinki. So I think we are running out of time. So I just give uh, uh, the last minutes first to Stefan uh, to answer, and then to Mark, and then let's wrap this up. 
Uh, the question in the chat, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, what, it's a great and very timely question because it sort of points to the future changes of a third party or, or like a ad tech development. So, but it's, it's kind of early question in a sense. I think there's so much to unpack in that type of solution. I, some of the questions hangs in the air still. There's lots to uh, unpack also in terms of federated learning development. Because sometimes, which I suspect, which I'm sort of curious about, they, that they may have this solutionist approach in one dimension. At the, okay, privacy, individual, personal data protection is very important, but that may, which I suspect, and I'm curious about, may introduce new challenges, maybe from another dimension. Uh, so, so I'm just, uh, I'm just um, sort of resisting to answer that more clearly. I think it's too hard to say yet. I need to, I need to uh, chew on that question for a while, I think. But it's a great question though, to follow up. Uh, I'll go. Uh, thanks, Patrice. That's a, it's a great unanswerable question, even if we had five hours as opposed to five minutes. Uh, so um, let me address it in two ways, both legally and institutionally. Legally, th these are issues that have been around since the beginning of freedom of information laws, uh, which is we have conflicts not only internally to open government laws, but also externally in the relationship between open government laws and other sets of laws and things that we are worried about. And the the, the typical structure by which this works as a legal matter is to have a broad mandate for disclosure with you know, either narrow or broad exemptions from those disclosures. Uh, and that leaves open the institutional question of how do we enforce both the mandate and the exception? Uh, and you know, we are often we often kick those questions either to courts or to uh, civil authorities, administrative agencies, and the like. Um, but oftentimes, in you know, in in the private sphere, with respect to the kinds of things uh, like private algorithms, uh, we we ultimately either leave them to the private entity to try to uh, resolve or have some sort of regulatory oversight. Of them. And there's no, there is no perfect way of resolving those issues. Not only because you can't do that, you can't resolve those issues either uh, at the broad level of legal mandates or at the individualized levels of, uh, of you know, justiciability um, because th there's too much conflict there. Uh, and, uh, and then at the normative level, we can't resolve, we have such a difficult time resolving the relationship between transparency and privacy. Um, that it's a it's an unresolvable conflict that we that we just continually either uh, resolve contingently uh, or we kick down the road to you know there will come a time at which we can figure this out uh, technology will assist us with this or law will assist us with this um, and and you know so I I share your concern about this. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, and and uh, for this uh, final words. I think we're good to to uh, uh, finish up with these uh, ideas. I think I would want to to uh, uh, take on something you said, not directly, but uh, kind of implied is but one of the transparency paradoxes. I think also in technology context is performing authenticity, and this is also something that sounds. Uh, oxymoronic, but I think that is what, what characterizes a lot of uh, our current uh, transparency practices and transparency discourse as we have learned from many angles today.